Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and listeners of all ages, to the 173rd episode of the Enough to Keep Going podcast here on the E2KG Network. On the E2KG Network, we come at you every week with a variety of topics. One week we'll be with our game experience show where we are diving into what we've been playing and uh, give ourselves a little bit of gaming assignments because we are, after all, grown ups who game and, and parents. So we, we know we like to put some uh, responsibilities in front of us. But also on those alternative weeks, we take a deep dive into industry news and analysis, trends of what's been going on. But every year around this time, we set aside one show to look back on the year, to reflect on our gaming experiences, and we come all together, all four of us, for the Gaming Superlative Show. So, without further ado, this is the 2020 E2KG Gaming Superlative Show. And with me tonight is Osiris Prime. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, thank you. I feel super under underaddressed, though, tonight. Well, you're not hosting duty, so, you know, not all of us can be Jeff Keighley, but at least I can find That's a sport true. coat. So... <laughs> Swiss Guard, how are you, sir? Doing very well. This is definitely my favorite show every year. And um, it's like the one that I actually, I always look forward to getting on and talking that with you good guys. Save. Like, this is the one yeah. that I actually look forward to. The rest of them, <sighs> But this is the one that I, you know, will look forward to a couple of months in advance and even start planning, you know, man, I'm going to, this is a strong contender for this category. It's an ongoing thing throughout the year. Yes, that is very true. And, and and just for those listening and, and viewing that are gaming superlatives, these are not just a, a game of the year in terms of best game or best art direction. We go into a host of topics. Sometimes sometimes they're good. Sometimes they're not so good categories. Sometimes, uh, you know, we peel back the layers a little bit more. And in true KG fashion, we break the mold on a number of categories as well. And leading us in shattering that mold is agastically stamus how are you sir i'm well i'm fine we got swiss here on the big pipe bandwidth connection tonight just in time for this year's yeah. fourth annual superlative awards that's right Something after went four right. years in the making he's finally on some fiber so and they're not they're not they're not exaggerating literally four years ago i said hey guys I signed up for Fiverr. I just got to wait for them to come to my house and install it. But it's here. And now he waited for four years. And consequently, this is actually our fourth Gaming Superlative show as well. So so let's, without further ado, let's get started. I am your host tonight, dressed to the mm, seven and a halfs. Um, I am DBQ Hams. So... Our first game, we're going to start off in true award show fashion and give you a, a nice, big, meaty, juicy one to start with before we dive into some, some other categories. So our first category is biggest surprise game. So that game that really surprised you, took you, you maybe had low expectations, maybe it came out of nowhere. Uh, it could be a surprise in a variety. Of ways. Maybe it was a story that took you and surprised you. So I guess at least... Please do us the honors and start us off. What was your biggest surprise game this year? So you, you are seeing E2KG production unfold in front of your very eyes in real time. So, of course, so first of all, I, don't, I mean, I hope I don't offend anyone else, but I, I, I feel very comfortable with DBQ leading us through the Superlative Award Show because, like, more so than anyone else, I think he's best suited to keep us on track and on time. I will say, though, of course, DBQ scrambled the order of the awards, <laughs> which I didn't realize. They're out of order from the way that I had them listed and sent them, so now I just have to... We'll, we'll be fine. But it was, <laughs> thank you for uh, keeping me on my toes and keeping me awake. Hey, biggest surprise game. Uh, I will admit I struggled a little bit with when I came back to this category this year because I was like, biggest surprise? And I know at one point we had a category, I think we've got it listed as something else now, where it was where it was meant to be biggest surprise in a game, and I had to remind myself this was the game that was that caught us the most by surprise. Um, for me, that game was Doom Eternal. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, I mean, kind of everything around the zeitgeist of the game, 
um, caught me by surprise. I was, of course, just as the game came out, shortly after the game came out, the, the country went into lockdown. So uh, I was amazingly surprised and I often uh, frustrated and often railed against the notion that was out there in the gaming community that, that this was the game of the year. Um, I was very surprised to find it was winding up in the VGA nomination for game of the year. And I was like, really? It's, it's, it's Doom. Um, and it's a fine game. Um, I, I, th I think also the reason I picked this was because it did have the biggest surprise in a game for me, which was that moment when I realized that the BFG did nothing against the Marauder, um, for which I was very frustrated and very surprised by. Here's this penultimate weapon that is, you know, the, the myth and the central piece of lore in the Doom universe, and here you get the thing, and they've created an enemy that it does nothing against, and that enemy isn't even a boss. So, uh, surprises all around for Doom Eternal. I was surprised by how successful it was. I was surprised by how much it was taken up by the gaming community. I was surprised that I stuck with it and finished the game for a person who doesn't com who plays plays a lot of games but doesn't complete a lot. Um, and and again, I was also surprised by uh, those uh, you know that element in the gameplay, but also a lot of the things that quite frankly kind of turned me off to the game. A lot you know the the, the amount of platforming there were, that there was in the game. Um, the number of uh, items that there were in the game that you really actually couldn't get to, you would see them in the early stages of the level, but you really couldn't get to them until you went completely around the level in a different way and would come back to them. So, uh, surprises all around. Uh, most of them not in a good way there, Bethesda. All right, so let's move from a big game surprise to a surprise that's a little smaller of a game. Osiris Prime, what was your surprise game of the year? Yeah, so. I think, as everybody knows, I'm a big Battle Royale guy. And there's actually a Battle Royale game that came out this year that I didn't... I had no idea it was coming out. I had, nothing, I had no idea what this game was about. It was Spellbreak, which is, um, you know, you use magic in this game. It's, you know, you can kind of fly around. You have a, a flight ability, like, all the time. Uh, but then you have, like, fire and lightning and, and wind and all these other kind of powers, toxic, uh, which is kind of poison, uh, that you can use. And it was... I had no idea about this game until I think like literally either the week or the week after it had come out. And I think I even talked about this on one of the shows too. Uh, it just came out of nowhere to me. And, you know, I saw it. I was like, uh, you know, there's another, um, I think I had just got off of hyperscape. I think at that point I kind of had jumped back into, um, I was starting to go back into Fortnite a lot at that point. Again, I had jumped off of, um, uh, uh, Warzone 2, I think, at that point. And I was like, I don't know if I want to, you know, jump into a new game. But, you know, I, I tried it, and yeah, I really enjoyed it. I like it. Um, the um, the gameplay was, you know, it was really great. It didn't, there was no problems. I didn't have any problems, at least, with any of the uh, the powers. and uh, Or the, one, the other thing, too, is you can actually kind of combine the powers, too, and make, you know, more powerful attacks and, you know, and defenses if you if you know how to you know how to work these powers so it was just it was just a, a total surprise in in every in every way for for this game for me um but yeah that's that was my my game this year spell break excellent i remember you talking about it on the show this year so a game that also i talked on the show and this is we're going to go from a small game to an even smaller game this game was a total surprise for me and it is a game that has stuck with me all year round so this is retro bowl so this is the uh, iOS, Android, Congregate game. This is Tecmo Bowl with touchscreen controls. It is basically that. It, if you like Tecmo Bowl, I, I think you're going to like this game. Uh, I have been playing it throughout the year. Um, I think I've actually logged about 95 seasons in it at this time. Uh, over three different devices. So I've had one career that went like 40 years, another one that I was in the 20s. I'm in another uh, my I'm in another I'm in another franchise. I was up in the 25, 30 years. Um, and I've started multiple, probably five or six different franchises at this point. So and it, the other piece of it, the surprise piece of it is one, it came out like the week before, the Super Bowl came out over Pro Bowl weekend, um, but the developer is one guy, uh, and he's been updating it all throughout the year. So they added audibles in, he's added replays in, he's expanded kind of the the drafting 
and scouting pieces of it. So it's something that he continues to add to all year round, and it's five dollars to buy the unlimited version. So well worth it uh, if you are a fan of retro uh, American football games. So that is mine, Retro Bowl. Find it on your your mobile device and give it a try. There's a free version out there that gives you a chance to to see if it's something that you might enjoy. So let's stick with small games. Let's jump back to a small game from a big publisher, though. What's your surprise game of the year? My surprise is Super Mario Brothers 35 for the Switch. So when they did their big 35th anniversary, they were talking about all the stuff that was going to come up. They announced this Battle Royale Mario Brothers game, which it's kind of strange, you know. I mean, I guess coming off the heels of Tetris 99, it's not that unexpected, but still, it was kind of like a odd pairing. Um, and I didn't have, you know, high expectations for it, but it was free to download, so I thought I'd give it a try, and I just had a blast when I was playing it. Um, uh, so I was surprised that it worked, to be honest with you. Like, I didn't think that it was going to be a thing. And as I got into it, um, you know, I was just having a lot of fun. My kids were cheering dad on as like it's winding down to the end. I'm getting in the top five. And as anyone drops off, it's like, oh, we're almost there. Unfortunately, they had to go to bed before um, I logged my first win. <laughs> but I stayed up for like another hour after that and got a second win in the same night. So it was it was a lot of fun. I didn't, um, you know, just a small free to play game from Nintendo that didn't really see coming and i had low expectations for and i had um I had a great time playing it so that's my surprise game of the year that was a fun little surprise and a, and a lot of fun as a game uh, i remember cheering with my family as my son got his first win there as well so let's stick in the nintendo realm and move over to our next category with new lease on life this is our best ported best remastered game of the year prime what is your New lease on life. Yeah, so once again, uh, Nintendo helps me out here because I don't think I had anything for this category until the end of the year here was Super Mario 3D All-Stars. So obviously this has three games, or this has, I shouldn't say obviously, this has three games in it, uh, Mario 64, Sunshine, and uh, the first Mario Galaxy. And we've seen, uh, obviously, 64 has been ported a bunch on DS and uh, other systems. With, I don't think it ever came to the Wii or the Wii U, but I know on the portables it it, it came out. I think a couple times actually. Um, we've seen obviously Galaxy is not you know a super old game, so it's it's fairly new. You can probably find that you know around. But Sunshine I think was the big one here because you literally unless you had the old system you couldn't play this game. It was never it never had been ported or anything before. So it was kind of nice uh, that we actually get to play that again. Uh, and I, that was probably until Odyssey. That was probably my my favorite uh, Mario game was Sunshine. So it's, it's nice that I can, you know, jump in and, and it's portable. So, you know, I can jump in and play that or I can play it on TV. So uh, that was my pick. Super Mario 3D All-Stars. Okay, so let's keep the 90s nostalgia rolling along here. And I'll take my new lease on life. And it is Final Fantasy VII Remake. So I'll be honest. I've never finished the original Final Fantasy VII. I have watched roommates play it in college. I have watched roommates fail classes as they continue to play it in college. Um, I have read multiple, you know, I still own my multiple disc copy of Advent Children. So I appreciate the world. I finished Final Fantasy Crisis Core. Uh, So again, I'm in that realm. But this game, uh, I played the demo, really loved it, and had a chance to come back to it uh, a couple different times during the year. And one, the the art design, the way that they've kind of rethought the active time battle and the the kind of real time combat in it is is engaging, but still has a little bit of strategy when you have to slow down and jump between characters to set up limit breaks. But the way the thing that really gets me, besides it being a beautiful game and the score being beautiful is really the ending and what they do with the story. And I'm not going to spoil anything here, but uh, that, to me, really put it over the top as just being a remake, but, but you know, not just being a remaster, but really taking it in, giving it the opportunity to go in all kinds of different directions. So Final Fantasy VII Remake. So yes, I know you're an RPG guy, but your choice for New Lease on Life is not an RPG at all. 
So, what's yours this year? It is not. Um, I haven't played many. Uh, I played Pikmin 3 and Mario 3D All-Stars. I didn't play too many remakes this year. So I ended up kind of looking at the list of what came out. And I just went for a pure nostalgia play. And I picked Need for Speed Hot Pursuit Remastered. And to be honest, I picked this game after I saw that Burnout Paradise had been remastered this year, and it made me angry. And then I remembered Need for Speed Hot Pursuit was here, and that was the pick. There was no other choice. So um, I, I picked the game that I most wanted, the remake that I most wanted to pick up. I never got around to it, but it's the one. And um, I will. I still want to play Final Fantasy VII Remake and put some more time into 3D All-Stars, but I put many, many hours Lot of early mornings with the Gascles and Need for Speed Hot Pursuit, so that's the pick. Nice. Well, let's go to our Gascles here and and hear his pick for New Leaves on Life, which is a game that we've all played multiple times and together, but is well deserving of this award. Yeah, I don't know. Have we actually played this game together? I think we've played a game in the franchise together. But uh, so uh, and before I do that, I just want to mention. So, so one thing that's a little weird this year um, is that. So this category originally started um, because of Destiny, and so well, it's listed at New Lease on Life slash Best Ported Game, but it can include games that have gotten a, a significant infusion of like creative. You know, so if Anthem had been turned around this year. Um, that could have been it. So, so I think we came up with this category the year that uh, Taken King came out, and we were all we had kind of gone up on Destiny and it come down, and then Taken King kind of brought that back around. Um, so I'll just mention that. That being the case, uh, none of our picks fall into that particular uh, selection type. Uh, for, well, I would say that this one kind of straddles that line. It, it, it is. It's a very weird one. It it, it depends on. It, it could qualify as that if, if it had been selected, if a person had selected it for that reason. Um, it, it kind of fills, um, fills both potential reasons why it might fall in this category. Uh, for me, that game was Halo, the Master Chief Collection, uh, and specifically the game on PC. So what DBQ mentions is, you know, in addition to the regeneration of all the single-player content, obviously this game also has a massive multiplayer online component, and I see tons of people playing the game uh, for that reason, um, there are lots of people that are engaged in like the seasonal, um, you know, uh, uh, month to month, quarter to quarter, whatever um, changes that they make and updates that they make and, and really enjoy uh, reliving their Halo uh, lives uh, inside the MCC. I fell in love with this in its new lease on life because there were games that I didn't play. I am a person who only played the core franchise, so really, to me, that's even just Halo 1, 2, and 3, um, which were, uh, did, I guess, did Bungie, Bungie did Halo 4, right? No, Bungie did Reach and ODST, and then they left after Reach, Okay. and 343 did Halo 4. Okay, so, you know, the, the original Bungie titles, uh, so all those other games, you know, Reach, ODST, that DBQ mentioned, um, and, you, and even four, I've never played. So, uh, you know, in combination with it being ported to the PC, where as much as I love consoles, I will admit games like this, I feel like play best. Um, and of course, all the lavish graphical updates uh, to them. Uh, and, and I'm actually, despite my personal philosophies on the whole concept of uh, that the Marvel that the MCU movies should not be watched in chronological order of the timeline. Um, I am actually playing through the Halo franchise in exactly that way. I'm actually playing it in the order in which the events occurred. So, uh, so this was my first year playing Halo Reach, and I had a blast um, playing it. Um, and now I'm, you know, playing a playing a uh, whatever. What is the subtitle for the first game? I'm Combat involved. Evolved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Much like Episode Six of New Hope, it's the subtitle that nobody ever remembers. But. Uh, but yeah, but you know, I, I fell in love with it because, like I said, it's a it's an opportunity for me to go back and touch a lot of the uh, uh, mythology that I've never been exposed to before. Excellent. Yeah, they really the PC ports have come around nicely. So, from some exciting positive categories and some highs, let's let's take a step back and talk about our most disappointing game experience. So, Swiss, please start us off with your most disappointing game experience, which. I'm pretty sure this one we all shared in at least somewhat together. Indeed. Um, first, though, I'm going to say I'm disappointed that Agascles said that episode six was a new hope and not episode four. 
Yeah, but, yeah. Um, so I was speaking quickly and got a little discombobulated. Yeah, you're absolutely right, <laughs> and I and I do know that. I'm just uh, just talking too fast. Thank <laughs> you. That, that, that helped save our show. We had, very we, crap, had so to, we had to, we had to, we had to say that. Okay. You so, know, it's been a while since we had a uh, a nerd alert in here. So <laughs> we had it's been a while. Um, mine is Crucible for the PC, and there was a little bit. I wouldn't say a lot of hype, but there was definitely some chatter in the gaming world um moving up to crucible um amazon wanted that like in-house uh competitive game specifically geared for like the twitch crowd i guess you could say and i know in the run-up to it there were a lot of streamers that were playing it kind of before it was released to build up some more hype um the main mode had like both pve and pvp concepts which reminded me kind of of destiny 2 gambit which is my favorite competitive mode in that game so i was um i was excited to try it out my wife was excited and i and we got with you i think db on launch day so the three of us all got together to play it and it was buggy and confusing and it didn't really work like i was actually feeling like the game was just like cheating me um so amazon you know, i wasn't the only one that felt that way amazon quickly removed some of the game modes they stripped away two or three of the modes, so there was only one left. Then they removed the game from Steam for anybody that hadn't already picked it up. And they were like, well, we're just going to work on it and try to, to fix it. And then I think recently they said they completely abandoned the project. So I think that's kind of a disappointment. If 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 Mario 35 was having me having low expectations and being pleasantly surprised, this was me having high expectations and being extremely disappointed. Yeah, I think this one is the one that was shared. We we definitely were excited to give it a try. Agastocles joined us the next night because the first night he was stuck in the tutorials that he couldn't get out of. Uh, so yeah, this was definitely falls up there. So my disappointing game comes around just a month later in around what would have been the E3 time. And I maybe should know better because it was an early access game, but it was a game that I was excited for for the past year or two i was kind of tracking its development you know when it was going to be a free-to-play game i was really interested to see where they were going to take it and i am of course not of course but i am talking about torchlight 3 or previously formerly torchlight frontiers so torchlight 3 when it launched in early access it was really early access uh, and i have come back to it uh, month after month uh, with different upgrades uh, and different updates and it is it's fine. It is. It is even. I would say good, um, but it's not as good as Torchlight Two, right? I mean, that's not right. It, it just there are too many legacy pieces of it being a free to play game, right? The base building aspects of it, and there's a number of kind of you know there are cannons throughout the first level that at one point must have done something, but now they just kind of shoot off in the distance and have no other purpose. And even the developers said they're just there for kind of aesthetics at this point. The the classes, you get a little bit of the kind of classic archer mage, but you also get some really kind of fun classes in terms of uh, a, a robot, a steampunk robot. You also get uh, an engineer that has a train that rides behind him that deals the damage. So they are doing some creative things, and it really will be something that I think over time will develop into something I'll enjoy more. But in part because I came from the Torchlight 2 and enjoyed the mod scene of that, where people had added so much to it that it evolved the game, that coming into Torchlight 3 and thinking that it was going to be as rich as a modded version of Torchlight 2, again, like, like you said, Prime, it kind of sets us up for disappointment. I mean, Swiss, that sets us up for disappointment. So Prime, now it's your turn. What were you disappointed in? Uh, so this was a game um, which kind of going in, um, I'm not usually the type to play these kind of like hero shooter and, you know, class-based um, kind of games, you know, like, um, uh, I was going to say Odd World for some reason. I don't know why. I Overwatch. Say Overwatch, yeah. Battleborn. Uh, yeah. So these types of games. But, um, you know, the three of us actually, you Swiss and UDB, we played this, um, I think it was probably when it first came out yeah it was like, or maybe like a beta when it or was in the beta yeah which would have been february march yeah so this is bleeding edge from ninja theory and you know ninja theory they've done some pretty good games they had heavily sword enslaved odyssey to the west they've done a couple of um devil may cries disney infinity which i didn't realize they had a part in 
Yeah, uh, Disney Hellblade. Infinity Three that helped with the combat. Yeah, uh, Hellblade, which I I love that game. Uh, but this, uh, I don't. <laughs> you know, most games, like even if 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 it's kind of okay, or even if it's kind of poor, like if you have friends that you're playing with, you can usually usually have a good time. But I just did not have any the, any sort of fun or any time any time type of good time on this game when we were playing uh, and it was nothing with you guys it was just the, it was just the game it was just like it, it seemed like okay like i don't know if you guys like db i think you play these kind of games sometimes every once in a while and swiss i'm not sure if you normally would play these but and obviously i, I usually don't i've tried them but i was just like okay i'll try it since it's the three of us but the fact that it was the three of us you know we were talking to each other and we were just getting destroyed like utterly destroyed and i think maybe there was one i think it was what it was four it's a four person team i believe for yeah it was, at least at that four. point there were four versus four yep yeah and we were just getting just annihilated and i was like what's going on man like this there's some, something's got to be going on with this game because there's there's no way that we should be getting like killed like every time like i think we played for like an hour hour and a half even maybe even two hours and, and yeah, i just didn't ha have any fun uh, on this game at all so yeah bleeding edge is my uh my most dis disappointing game experience this year I, I remember when we stopped that your your last words were yeah that's enough and then you like, <laughs> like instantly uninstalled it after we played. Yeah, uh, that uh, the bleeding edge and crucible Venn diagram are very similar in terms of our E2KG experiences. So, Gasicles, you've been left out of these disappointing game experiences, but you've had one of your own. So, talk us through your most disappointing game experiences here. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because I've probably sunk more time into this game. Uh, than any other this year. Um, I'm on my third restart uh, most recently. Um, and, and I will admit, in the, the third time around, uh, the game is is mating with my palette a little bit better, but but I have to retros retrospectively look at that and say that that's definitely because I know of the things that are that are disappointing to me that are coming, right? And I've I've already kind of agreed beforehand that I'm willing to, to endure those. Uh, so my, my most disappointing game was The Last of Us Part Two, um, and I'm sure that the, the internet, the walls of the internet are crumbling as I say that, um, you know, because concurrently I can, I can definitely say I have zero problem whatsoever with that game being selected as game of the year at the VGAs and all of the other categories that it won. You know, I can't really question that. I mean, it did, it did have a good narrative. Um, I, I know a lot of people had a problem with the social issues. I didn't have any problem with any of those, um, it, and I had no problems with the with the story in its in its base. Uh, what I had problems with is I had problems with pacing. I had problems with overly long cutscenes. I had problems. You know, K Med and I have talked about this on uh, on 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 you know why the internet needs to calm down about gaming. You know, but. I had problems with the fact that they are constantly yapping, right? Like, like not even in cut, not just in cutscenes, but as you transition back into the real world, like the characters are constantly talking. And there's a part of that that's okay. I mean, there's character development there, but I mean, there's a part of, part of it where I'm just like, or like when I stream that game, like I like I don't do a lot of voiceover commentary because literally I can't get a word in edgewise, um, and it just frustrates me like beyond all. And I'm like, come on, like. You know, they're, they're talking in the middle of combat and, and things like that. Um, but I would say the most disappointing thing to me, you know, we talked a lot about the original Destiny, and again with No Man's Sky, about how the marketing around those games didn't appropriately convey to gamers what those games really were or what they were going to be. Um, and I mean the original Destiny, not Destiny 2. Um, and, and I feel like that was done to me. We saw this game twice at E3 before it came out. And I was definitely given the impression because that you know they they showed examples of combat and in each of those instances they named who your opponents were, and it definitely conveyed to me that a lot of this I mean this is a story of vengeance, but it 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 conveyed to me that it was a story of of where the vengeance was very personal, um, and so you know one of my favorite games in terms of antagonists is is Gun from Activision, which I think was a two thousand five game. And and as I went through that game, again, don't complete a lot of games. One of the reasons I completed that game was because, like, the, the villain in that is just a horrible human being. And I felt very compelled to just march through and trudge through that and take him down and take vengeance on him for what he had done to me and my family. I, I thought that's what I was going to get with The Last of Us Part Two, And, like, you... 
you know, you, you know, think things are done to you, but like, first of all, there's a, I caught it in the game in the third run through this time. I caught like at a certain point in the game, I don't know, I'll call it five or six hours in, maybe 10, no, more like 10 hours in, you know, there's a scene where you're told, you know, that's three down. And I'm like, who in the heck are the three people who were there at the tragic event, right, that, that I took, like, I didn't even know that I had fought them at all. And so, you know, there's, there, there's a lack of tying a very personal experience to that tale of vengeance. And, and I felt like that's what was conveyed in the two E3s. That's what I thought I was getting. Um, and I was, you know, highly disappointed by the fact that that's not, that, 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 that doesn't feel like it's really tethered. And it just feels like vapid ultra violence. Um, in a game that is, in some ways, not entirely different from uh, from a Call of Duty or a Mortal Kombat, right? It's just like the combat's kind of neat, but it's like there's there's no there's no emotion hooked to it at all. Yeah, I, I, I thank you for sharing that because I think that this is one of the more talked about games, uh, either beloved or or kind of disappointed as well so i'm glad to see it i'm glad us to have a chance to kind of talk about it as well so let's move into our next category which is a wretched hive of scum and villainy as we just made a star wars reference before so let's keep that going but this is our game most emblematic of sleazy business practices this uh, grew out of 2017's battlefront loot box ea debacle uh but it has evolved into a variety of things so swiss why don't you start us off with your sleazy business practice all right so i'm gonna go with um i'm gonna reach way back in 2020 i'm gonna go with blizzard for warcraft 3 reforged and um I, there was a time when I was excited about playing this, and then when it kind of hit the when the reviews kind of hit the web, uh, that desire dissipated. Um, but if you remember, there was a lot of hype built up. You know, we're gonna remaster the game, and it's gonna be awesome, and they're gonna be able to, you know, we're gonna redo the cutscenes, and they showed some like redone, like um, much more cinematic cutscenes, and uh, you're gonna be able to play it with current warcraft 3 players like you can choose whichever kind of skin you want but it, it'll all be integrated so there was there was a lot of hype built up for it and i think that blizzard kind of did start to t try to damp like temper expectations a little bit um but that wasn't as they weren't really i don't know if they didn't try hard enough or people just didn't want to listen but when the game hit uh, one, it didn't meet what people thought that they had been promised. Um, two, it broke the game for, like, it removed modes that, like, current Warcraft 3 players had been using for a long time. <laughs> like, so there was, there's just a lot that, like, went down with it. Um, and uh, people, people were upset. So uh, when, I know this is kind of, like, there's not, like, I don't know if scum and villainy scum and villainy might be strong for this, but still, come like come on, Blizzard, um, you're taking a very beloved game and beloved franchise, and you kind of bungled it. So that's my pick. Yeah, no. yeah, that was the game I was gonna. I was looking at pre-ordering actually, and and glad I didn't. But yeah, it was a game, a beloved game. What were you gonna say, Gasicles? I'm right there with Swiss. I, I I feel like Wretched Hive of Scum and Villainy is right is right on point with with this. I, I mean, the reality is is there's a there's a not small not insignificant demographic of Warcraft gamers from a myth and lore perspective who had who were disenfranchised when Blizzard went down the path of WoW, and all that we've wanted is for Blizzard to get back to that single player RTS type of game, and and here it was after decades of wait, and like it's like it's just like the code is just broken. Like and like and it hasn't been fixed. So yeah, no, I'm with you. Good, good pick. Good deep cut. I'd forgotten about that whole debacle. So I'll go next with my sleazy business practice one, and this one I struggled with because I really enjoy the game, and I 
found a lot to love and lost hours in it this fall. But I also, you know, the more I played it, the more I realized it feels at home on mobile because it is very much in that loot box gotcha type of game. And this is Genshin Impact. This is Mahoyo Studios out of, out of China. A, a, a technical feat. I mean, it is a beautiful kind of uh, anime-inspired game, a giant open world with a lot of stuff to do, good exploration, uh, interesting characters and story, uh, but at the same time, so many free-to-play mechanics in there. You know, currencies on top of currencies, feeding uh, weapons to other weapons to level them up. You hit a character max, and you need certain uh, certain materials and resources to be able to put them above that max, which then are difficult to gain in the game, but can be relatively, you know, there is always the, the purchase you can make. You know, they've continued to create releases and updates that have added more characters, which only, you know, provide more options for the gotcha mechanics. Uh, but at the same time, it's fun to play, uh, but there is a, you kind of hit that free to play wall. Like uh, I enjoyed the time I had with it and I wish I could have enjoyed it more. But you know, there are people who continue to play it. There are streamers who have spent thousands of dollars trying to unlock, uh, you know, to loot box it up. Uh, so it felt very much within this category uh, as well for me. So Prime, let's uh, let's move to you in a related topic here. And what is your uh, sleazy business, wretched hive of scum and villainy choice? Yeah, and before I get to mine, I, um, I, I played a little bit of, of Genshin Impact, and I like pretty much everything you said. I mean, it's, it's beautiful, you know, great gameplay. One reason I, I jumped off of it though, and and I know it's just because well, it's not just on mobile, but I don't have. I think it's on PlayStation Four also. I believe. Yep, PlayStation Four uh, and PC as well. PC, yeah. So I don't have, um, I don't think I'd have a PC that would run it, but I, obviously I don't have a PS4. But on mobile, you know, it runs fine on my uh, my Pixel, my Pixel 3. But there's no uh, controller support, though. Or at least there wasn't. I don't know. Maybe they've patched that in now, but I just thought that was kind of weird. So it was all just touch screen, which is, no, <laughs> can't do that, on, especially that type of game uh, where you're trying to fight people. And even just for the, just the aesthetics, you know, just the scenery. I mean, it, it was, it's... I mean, even playing on my phone, it's it's a gorgeous game. So I was just kind of surprised that they didn't have uh, controller support on there. I don't know. If, no, I don't know if on PC maybe if they do. Um, I never really looked into that, but I just thought that was kind of a missed opportunity there. But anyways, so yes, mine is not really a game per se, but the people who play them. So mine was streamers, and this might have been, I think this might have been one maybe last year or a couple years ago. Uh, just you know, I don't know if like maybe heads are getting too big or, you know, what's going on lately or I don't know, but it, it just seems like there's, you know, I, you have, you know, obviously, you know, we've had problems with like, you know, racism and sexism and, you know, all the, the sexual harassment stuff that's happened o over the year. Um, but even going beyond that, like some of the, the people that I used to actually watch was not, not necessarily on stream, but like kind of like their, I guess, video on demand, if you want to call it like kind of the stuff that they've, they've put out like later on. And it's, it's like they'd have like a certain title or just even some of their descriptions of the of the video would be one thing, but it was it had nothing to do with either the game they were talking about or it hadn't, you know, it was, and I hate to say it, but more just the, like a lie because it was like, how, how can you like put up like, say it was like a Fortnite thing and it's like, hey, this is how you can, you know, um, I don't know, get like a free skin or something like that. Some, maybe not something like that, but that's just an example you know, and you go into it and it's like has nothing to do with getting a free skin or if it's it's technically not really a free skin, you have to do like jump through hoops and even try to buy some stuff also. It's that kind of like secondary thing. So I was like, I'm just kind of sick of that kind of stuff. And I actually, you know, dropped a bunch of people, you know, that I used to watch because of that. Uh, and then just the just the kind of like the um, entitlement that sometimes we see, we, I shouldn't say sometimes, I've definitely seen the last few months uh and this is more so with like Fortnite and even more so Warzone. People um, just complaining about uh, the um, the matchmaking. So the matchmaking now Fort on Fortnite, it's it's that was more of a more recent thing, and uh, Warzone came out with it pretty much right away. Uh, and now even on, um, I think they still have it on um, Cold War. Uh, but the these guys, you know, complaining that hey, you know, I'm getting put in a, a, a lobby with 
you know, the, the same level of people that I'm at. So, you know, I can't get, you know, as many kills as I usually, I usually I used to get. I was like, really? I mean, come on. Like, I get it. Like, yeah, you don't want to, um, you don't want to be like all tense and stuff like all the time. But I mean, in the same, in the same respect, you got to think about, you got to kind of think about the big picture too. I mean, when, 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 the, when the companies put these matchmaking um, uh, things in there, they're not just thinking of the streamers, you know, thinking of everybody. So like, like someone for me, like if, to be honest, if they didn't have the matchmaking in Fortnite, I would, I was like getting a win maybe like once every quarter, if I was lucky. And, you know, once they put that matchmaking in, I, you know, I was put in, you know, the same level uh, games as, you know, that I am at. So actually, you know, I do win a lot more and same thing with Warzone uh, and maybe a little bit more with Cold War because Warzone, I hate to admit, I still haven't won a game in Warzone, <laughs> at least in the Battle Royal, the Battle Royal, uh, part of it um but uh yeah that that was so that was my thing i, I don't want to i could probably keep going but i'll just stop there so streamers fair enough president, oh, oh, oh wait wait present company excluded by the way <laughs> okay nice big asterisk there so okay. let's jump from one soapbox to another gasicles what is your sleazy business practice this year or not yours but your choice <laughs> Now, yeah, no, I really love some of these picks. I, I, I like Primes. I, I think Primes is like an extension of, I think last year I picked uh, the gaming community in general um, because of the just like the entitlement and like the childishness with which we treat, you know, the creators who build the, the, the games that we love. And, and yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you, Prime. And the fact that, you know, streamers became very self-obsessed, very self-centered this year. Um, again, I, th I think a lot of people forget that like, you know, I'm going to be hated on for saying this, but like, most streamers who have made a name for themselves by playing a game, they wouldn't have been able to make a name for themselves if it weren't for the creators who developed that game, right? Like the like the, the developers and the creative director and the producer, those are the people who are really making content, con who are really content creators um, putting things out there. Uh, but I digress, that's a soapbox for another day. Uh, my pick is again another soapbox this year. Uh, I didn't really have um, a publisher, which is generally what we pick, uh, who put out a game um, who had a sleazy business practice behind it. Um, I went a little broader and went with uh, kind of the whole console, commercial, or commerce, retailer um, cohort involved in how pre-orders, and even beyond pre-orders now, after the launch windows have been, uh, orders just have been handled with the new consoles. And, and on top of that, you know, the the new video cards as well. Like, it's really appalling, and, uh, you know, I, I mentioned earlier in the year, you know, before uh, the launch that, you know, I, I felt like there were things that could be done, like the fact that nobody put a CAPTCHA up in front of their stinking storefront, like, that's just ridiculous, like, it would take two minutes of effort, um, you know, Great Scott, like, forums that you, like, download and apply to websites come with the CAPTCHA technology package, you just click it and turn it on, Um but in particular, you know, some some have been more egregious than others. I specifically pointed out Walmart for the fact that you you can go onto the Walmart site, you can find an Xbox Series X for four ninety nine, sold from Walmart, says it's sold out, out of stock, whatever. It's just like Amazon; they allow uh, other stores to sell through their web presence. So, kind of like when you go into Amazon, you have to look at like who the seller is, uh, because if it's not Prime or whatever, it may not ship. You know, it, it won't say ship and sold by Amazon. Walmart lets other people sell them, and so they're letting people who are using bots buy an Xbox Series X for four ninety nine because they can defeat anybody who's just a human being buying it, and then turn around and sell that same Xbox Series X on the Walmart website for $1,300. So, you know, it's it's one thing when they buy it from a storefront and then go off to eBay. Yeah, those things are to be expected. But the fact that, like, they're scalping the product exactly on the same website, like Walmart, I feel like well, it's incumbent upon Walmart to take some action. That's There, there are thresholds to a free market economy, and I feel like that, that, that breaks it. Um, but also, I'll just lump into this category since I'm kind of it's kind of like commerce and retail in general. Um, obviously, the Xbox Series X and S and the PlayStation Five require a TV with HDMI 2.1 to achieve 120 frames per second uh, at 4K because HDMI 2.0 and less doesn't have the bandwidth to convey that. It's not a problem on PC because we can use DisplayPort and so it can push that. So, like, I was completely even oblivious to this notion until this year, because again, I use DisplayPort, so I've never even, 4K above 60 hertz, it's a thing that we do all the time. 
retailers right now are pushing 4K TVs at huge discounts, and they're saying that they're 120 frames per second, but they're not HDMI 2.1. And so when you hook up a PS5 or or a new Xbox to it, it's not going to do 4K at 120. They're pushing them and bearing those details down, so people are you know going to flock to the those sales and websites, buy those TVs, and then get disappointed because they don't understand the spec behind it. So. That's that's what I'm putting on the putting on the pyre of uh, rich and scum and villainy this year. All right, well let's move on from the negativity and let's talk about some developers or publishers who have come back in the face of negativity. Uh, so this next category is our developer publisher with the best attitude in the face of adversity. So I think we all can agree that 2020 was a heck of an adverse year for for working conditions, for living conditions, for mental health conditions. So the, the the gamut of what people could choose for this category is all over the place. But let's see what our esteemed panelists chose. Agasicles, your choice for best attitude in overcoming and facing adversity. Yeah, and since I ended off the last category and started this one. It was a race to find the uh, my pick for this. <laughs> it was actually uh, 343 Studios. So, um, and, and this is kind of a Lifetime Achievement Award in some ways. Uh, it's, it's kind of like Denzel when he won his Oscar for a movie that wasn't his best the year after because he didn't win it for Malcolm X. Uh, but that's, again, another soapbox for another day. Um, but this is, um, you know, 343 has endured a lot. And look, I, I get it. I don't know that anybody would want to follow Bungie uh, onto the stage you know, um, after, you know, the greatness that they had rendered with the original uh, chapters in Halo. 343, in my opinion, has done a fine job. I mean, you can you can argue, first of all, the, the, the salient points of arguing, you know, which Halo is the best is kind of a, I, I think of them all kind of in aggregate. And so picking apart, you know, whether one is better than the other kind of falls down for me. Um, but 343 has pumped a lot of creative energy into the Halo franchise. I would contend that they maybe have the greater legacy when it comes to multiplayer, just in terms of the total number of players that they've supported and the length of the legacy and and the maintenance of, you know, everything that was done before and adding on to it now, Um, particularly in something like the MCC where there's just, there's not Halo 2 multiplayer, there's just Halo multiplayer. Um, they've, you know, ported the code from console onto PC. That's a huge effort, and they've done that concurrently while working on Halo Infinite. And so I get it, Halo Halo Infinite was canceled, you know, but they're a studio that just gets slagged for kind of every little thing that they do. Like, it's, it's, I'm sometimes amazed that people work there because it's, it's kind of one of those situations where they're kind of like, no matter what they do, nobody's ever going to consider them, you know, the equal of Bungie or nothing's ever going to be good enough. Um, and so, you know, dealing with the, the reveal of the Xbox series X and S, uh, uh, event in, I think that was, it was in, in August when, when that whole controversy went down or sometime in the, that time frame. Um, and then dealing with, you know, Halo Infinite being canceled. And then I think it was the creative director, leaving and of course that's sprouting a lot of rumors that you know that whole team was under duress um which again i don't know that i've seen any corroboration of at the to the extent of you know the anthem team um I, so i just you know and and what i love about 343 is amazingly 343 ignores all of it we haven't had things like the way respawn dealt with um with people who were slagging Apex, right, and and their developers in in reset on reset era and in Reddit chats, blowing things up, or like the developer who blew things up for I don't remember know who the publisher is, but uh, whoever does Guild Wars, yeah, getting into it with their community, we haven't had that. Like whatever Microsoft is doing and whatever that development team is doing about, quite frankly, just just keeping their team in line, because because I have problems with people who are on social media who have like their publisher name and, and they're known to be an employee of that company. I mean, I, I mean, every company that I've worked for, and I'm sure Microsoft is the same, says you're not a representative of the company. What you say in social media doesn't, right? But everybody, but 
but at the same token, you got to be careful about what you say. And and those examples that I cited, those people aren't really careful. <laughs> like they they go out and they get in the mud and they wallow with the pig and they they suffer the consequences for it. And their and their companies do so. Three four three, in my opinion, has done an immaculate job of managing um, that. And and largely that's just by they just keep doing their job and putting out content and they let sales speak for themselves. So I agree with you there, especially in the lifetime achievement piece, right? The, their, the length of time that they've spent uh, re, revising and, and correcting Master Chief Collection. And then just what they've done on PC has been excellent. I do want to make a correction that Halo Infinite has not been canceled. It's only been delayed until 2021. But I think you're right. Like in some ways, this is a twofold. This is both their work on Master Chief, but also the adversity and the feedback they got uh, after the reveal of Infinite. So, Swiss, let's move on to to your choice of best attitude in the face of adversity. I picked Creative Assembly for Total War Saga Troy, and um, I mean, it, all, all the publishers kind of had to deal with COVID, obviously, but. Um, this is a game that had uh, an Epic Store exclusivity deal, and there's some, like, many corners of the internet. It's, you know, having those Epic exclusivity deals aren't exactly popular for a lot of PC gamers. And um, so Creative Assembly kind of took a creative approach and said, hey, you know what? We're going to give away Total War Saga Troy 3 if you download it in the first 24 hours and 7.5 million people went to the epic store despite their mis misgivings about it and downloaded it and they you know they were they were up front they said you know we wouldn't have been able to do this if epic hadn't provided uh the financial backing but we're also getting our game out there so people can um maybe people that hadn't w wouldn't typically play a, a a strategy title like this um could could tool around with it so um creative assembly uh is my pick for this excellent thank you so prime you've got another one which i think could go toward a, a, a mm, council generation achievement award here for for your choice as well so what is your best attitude in the face of adversity yeah, so this is uh, kind of like, I guess, this is kind of a lifetime achievement uh, award. Uh, this is Hello Games, the makers of No Man's Sky. Um, they, I think they've, they just hit it out of the park this year. I mean, they had, I think about, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, maybe six different uh, updates this year that just kind of built upon No Man's Sky. Uh, they had the living ship. They had the uh, exo, the uh, exo Max, the exo suit that you can you can jump into. Uh, they have crossplay. Uh, multiplayer crossplay that you can do between all the uh, system consoles and PC. Uh, Desolation, which was the kind of a, um, abandoned ships that you can go into, and, and you know they're procedurally generated. So uh, just like the planets and stuff, and the animals that that uh, occur in the different worlds in the game. Uh, Origins, uh, which brought back I guess more variation, which I I didn't. I kind of I guess I kind of noticed that when I kind of jumped back into it this year, but. Basically, all the the plants and the uh, the animals on, on the different worlds kind of were kind of samey, uh, at least within the same system. You know, if you went to different systems, it, they kind of varied a little bit more, but it was still kind of the, the same thing. But now they've they they thrown that variation back into that that uh, uh, into the into the animals and the plants and everything now, uh, and then just kind of just out of nowhere, like. I don't think this was ever even discussed or anything, or maybe people asked them, you know, if you're going to do anything for the, the you know, the Series X and PS5, and Series S. Um, they, they did a, a next gen port of the game, which actually, to be honest with you, is one of the reasons I actually really want an Xbox Series X, uh, so I can play the the new version of, of No Man's Sky in there. Because they, I mean, right now, like when you go on a planet, you just kind of have space ports, which we, you can land your ship, and then there's just like a little hub on, on you know, like a little on a platform, and maybe some like, they call them settlements, but it's like two or three, maybe four buildings at the most that you can kind of go into. But they have like cities now that you can, or at least little towns that you can go into. And, and uh, the graphics are just like super overhauled, you know. Uh, so it just looks like, you know, like a, a really great update. And I really want to, I want to play it on the, on the new, uh, on the new system. So, but yeah, I think they've, you know, and they took a lot of crap, you know, obviously from when they first uh, released No Man's Sky. Uh, to their fault, maybe, and or might have been Sony, because I think it was on uh, the PS4 four originally 
um you know uh, PC. yeah uh for like maybe over and hyping it a little bit and you know uh, i think they kind of you know kind of put you know uh their foot in their mouth too a little bit there over uh over um stating some things that they had in the game which really weren't there uh, you know in the release but you know they built up to that since since then so i think uh hello games is uh really really hitting it hitting all cylinders now excellent yes uh it started on playstation 4 then it went pc and it went xbox so just want to correct myself here so my choice is both also in the face of adversity in terms of covid working from home development but also the face of adversity in terms of hardware limitations. And so my choice is the developer Camouflage. So this is Ryan Payton Studio, Ryan Payton from Metal Gear Solid 4. Uh, but Camouflage uh, developed uh, the Iron Man VR game. So this game is a joy to play. It is super fun. It tops my experience in Marvel's Avengers, the Crystal Dynamics game. It throws you right in the middle and you are, you know, the flight aspects of it. It does so much with such a challenge of the, the realities of PlayStation VR um, in terms of the motion tracking, in terms of the load times, that this is a game that would really benefit if it could be on other platforms because it is a, a beautiful uh not necessarily a beautiful in terms of graphics, but it really is a, a realization of being a superhero in a game. So this is Camouflage uh, Iron Man VR. All right, well, I'm going to stay on the mic and move right into our next category, which is one of our new ones for this year, and this is Best Storycraft. So this could be narrative, it could be plot, it could be, you know, a whole different other pieces here. So we've got a little bit of open interpretation in terms of, of our storycraft. And as a librarian, I put myself first just because I have the ability to do that as the host. So mine actually for the first, for the last few weeks has been Marvel's Avengers. I, I loved the actual campaign of that. It was a great comic book story. It compelled me forward. It was something that you could, you know, it was the, the popcorn movie chewing through the scenery and just a really beautiful joy, but that is not my choice. My choice is, a different game, a game from Vanillaware, which has done Mirabasa, which has done Odin Sphere, uh, games that it did, uh, Dragon's Quest, uh, Dragon's Crest, uh, games that I have enjoyed mechanically, not always artistically. Um, so this game is 13 Sentinels Aegis Rim. So this is, uh, it is a combination of a visual novel and a strategy game. Um, but I'm a sucker for time travel games. I'm a sucker for a sci-fi story with multiple layer sci-fi, uh, multiple layer time travel aspects in here. And so this this throws you back into that kind of vanilla wear aesthetic. And if you can get past the anime aspect of it, there's a really interesting uh, story that goes on here. And it's all told in little vignettes. It's told in little chapters. And so it was something that I was able to kind of consume over the course of a number of weeks. But you know do a chapter or two a night and kind of come back to it and so it was it's a game only on playstation 4 at this point but i kind of surprised myself with this pick but if you haven't checked it out or you're a fan of of genre sci-fi storytelling or anime it is well worth uh, giving it a look as well so our next up is I'm going to go to Gasicles for our next pick here in StoryCraft. StoryCraft was actually your suggestion for a category this year. So what game caused you to put this, to propel this for category forward? Yeah, and so uh, this is my chance for a correction. Uh, it's however slight. I think we had this category last year, um, and I think the thing was, I think we struggled trying to like nail down a, a definition and a concurrence amongst the four of us, you know, that represented it. And uh, I, I think it's probably nearest to the VGA's notion of best narrative. Um, but we have a few different takes on it. Um, so, uh, so my pick for this year was uh, Ghost of Tsushima. Um, and again, this is a rail against the VGA selection, which was uh, the last of us part two. Again, I, I think that the narrative on the last of us part two is great. Um, just in terms of what I felt 
appealed to me um, at, at my gamer core more so was Ghost of Tsushima. Um, and, you know, one of... Uh, I, I'm probably going to violate one of my own rules, which is that you should be able to talk about why a thing is good um, without necessarily comparing it to why another a different thing is bad. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and take this opportunity to say, you know, part of my problem with The Last of Us Part Two is it is so... It's it's all t- and, and and maybe that's okay, but like it's so tied to everyone's um, romantic relationships. Um, and again, no problems with with the social messages that were in that. It's just like, can we at some point just make this? And it's not it's not a you know I, I, I'm an action movie guy. I don't want romance in my action movies. I get it. Look, the only reason to want to be an action hero is to get the girl at the end, right? Or the love interest at the end. Um, I completely get that. I mean, what the heck is the point in being a Superman if you don't, you know, if your girlfriend's not going to be Lois Lane? Um, you know, but, but like, Ghost of Tsushima, in my mind, kind of unbuckled itself from that singular kind of notion that seemed to be the focus of The Last of Us Part Two, and in some ways delivered a narrative that was more complex, right? The, the, the love interest part of it was was kind of one small element. It wasn't conclusive about everything. It was it was familiar relationships. It was friend relationships. It was uh, so many different things and so many different aspects and takes and really harkened back to that notion that, you know, the, the great spaghetti Western genre out of Hollywood kind of came from um, these Japanese, uh, these, these Japanese tales uh, from the East. And I definitely kind of felt that earthiness um, and that groundedness in the notion of Ghost of Tsushima, um, it just, it's, you, you know, it's, I wasn't happy all the time that I was playing, that I played Ghost of Tsushima. It's a game I need to get back to in terms of emotionally uplifted, um, but I was definitely super interested, right, at, at every turn of, like, the the emotional uh, and the relationship aspect, whereas The Last of Us Part Two just hit on certain elements that I just... There were so many points where I just rolled my eyes and I was like, okay, like, can we move on? Um, and part of it is, again, that, that yappiness in between cinematic cutscenes, which you don't have um, in Ghost of Tsushima. You know, you you have your set pieces, you have your, you know, uh, you, you have your dialogue in your script, and then that ends, you, you kind of wipe your hands free of it, you get on to action, you handle business, and then you get back to a cinematic cutscene at some point. So I just felt like the overall narrative delivery um, and the structure of that tale uh, was a little more appealing to me than The Last of Us Part Two. Excellent. So, as we round into the first half of our show, let's keep some of the foreshadowing going in terms of games that we'll be coming back to in the second half. Swisscar, you also have a game here that is going to get mentioned again, but why did you put it here as your best story craft? Um... I picked uh, Paper Mario the Origami King, and I will be honest and say that I was really probably leaning Ghost of Tsushima for a long time as well. So that was the very, uh, very competitive runner up. But I think I ended up giving the nod to Paper Mario the Origami King because for me, that's the the absolute best part of Paper Mario. So there's, um, you know, the the battle system and whatnot um, leave a little bit to be desired. It, it's okay, but it's not great. What makes Origami King a joy to play is just the 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 clever storytelling and um, the dialogue. And so just like as a tip of the cap to um, the writers and 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 um, everybody that kind of de- designed that story in that game, uh, I, I wanted to um, to recognize that. So, Paper Mario: The Origami King edges out Ghost of Tsushima for me. Excellent. So, Prime, what was your best storycraft of the year? I was actually uh, struggling struggling not because like i didn't play any good games or anything like that but just because i was kind of throwing around a couple games and actually paper mario was my was my first choice at first um but then kind of thinking about it immortals phoenix rising which is a newer game that just came out recently from ubisoft uh i'm really enjoying this game i really 
I'm really getting into the story, but mostly because it's it's um, you know kind of Greek um, mythology. You know, I'm always a sucker for any of those kind of stories. You know, I've always I've always tried to watch any kind of movie or read books and you know do all that kind of you know get that kind of content with uh, any kind of uh, Greek and mythology stuff. So this was kind of right up my alley. Now, I was a little surprised because this was almost one of my surprise games also because it's actually pretty funny. It's a pretty funny game. Uh, the banter between Prometheus and um, Zeus, uh, you know, they, they kind of go back and forth. And it's not as, anno- you know, as annoying maybe as, as The Last of Us Part Two. Like, they kind of jump in there every once in a while, but it's not a constant thing. Um, uh, like I guess because he was saying with Last of Us Part Two. This is more, I mean, they do talk a lot at the beginning, obviously, because they're trying to set up the story. But then, you you know, kind of hear them throughout, you know, as you're going through the the um, uh, the world, uh, you know, doing your missions and everything. And even, like, on some of the cut screen, uh, the cut scenes, or not cut scenes, uh, the, um, kind of the loading screens, they have, like, little hints and stuff, you know, like, hey, you know, if you want to, um, you know, beat a certain enemy, you know, you do this. And then there's, like, a little blurb from Zeus, like, underneath, or Prometheus, you know, saying kind of, you know a funny comment or something like that. So it's just kind of those little things too that are kind of in there uh, that makes this my pick for best story craft. Now I haven't finished it, so I can't say if it's, you know, like a best story, if it ends well, but uh, I do, I do pick it because of the, just kind of the surprising elements of it. Uh, just kind of the funny, funniness. Cause I thought it was more of a kind of serious, you know, kind of like a God of, um, not God of War, um, Assassin's Creed type of a story, but it, it really surprised me with the, uh, the funny beats in it. So that's my choice. Excellent. Yeah, I have been enjoying that game and the story uh, as well as we were talking a little bit in the pre-show. But stay on the microphone here and keep that that humor uh, thread going here because our next category is best comic relief, either overall story or a character in the game. So what is your choice here, Prime? Does 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 Emoto's Phoenix Rising win two categories in a row for you? It does not. <laughs> no. Uh, it's actually, and I'm sorry if I messed up your... Um... <laughs> your flow here with uh with this one because i think it would have led into to this category but it's uh the toads from paper mario origami king um you know you you know you have to go around the in the in the world here in paper mario and find these guys and they always you know spouting like you know you know funny sayings and just kind of funny things as you find them or just like if they're already in there in the world and you know you're talking to them so uh yeah it's the toads in paper mario and i do have to say it was a tough choice because i really don't like the toads <laughs> For me, in Mario Kart and uh, Mario Party, they, these are the guys that are always getting me, always, you know, messing me up at the end, like in uh, Mario Party, you know, giving uh, stars to, to people who shouldn't be getting it. And in Mario Kart, I'm always getting the blue shells for them. But yeah, but they're they're definitely, you know, uh, a highlight of, of uh, the Paper Mario or Gami King. See, my favorite toad is the New Jersey toad from Super Mario Super Show. Mario! So, but I will stick with you and go Toads in the Paper Mario Origami King as well as the, the times that I have chuckled the most this year in a game. And in part, it's because I played Paper Mario with my, my son, sitting on the couch together, and we both kind of, sometimes they're like cringeworthy dad humor jokes. But the again, um, you know, Treehouse does a really good localization stuff, and they have a lot of fun with the dialogue and and kind of the the self awareness that they bring to the Morio universe in it as well. So uh, we are uh, two in a row categories, two in a row nominees here for the first time tonight. Agasicles, break up this Toad love fest and tell us what is your comic relief of of this year. Yeah, so I'll go a little more uh, uh, mature and explicit content, uh, so to speak, uh, only in terms of MPAA ratings. Not to say that you know. My selection is more mature than yours. Um, but one of the games I went back to this year uh, under the guise of its remake was uh, Mafia uh, Definitive Edition. Um, and I, I bought the whole pack of all of those, Mafia 1, 2, and 3. Uh, I haven't played through all of them, but, you know, in, in playing through uh, Mafia, the original Mafia, um, as much of it as I did, you know, you're re-exposed to the character Polly. And so if you're a fan of things like um, The Sopranos or... Uh, What's the, I'm forgetting the name. I'm brained up in the name of the movie now, but the the Joe Pesci, uh, Ray Liotta. Yeah, Goodfellas. Goodfellas. Yep. Um, if you're a fan of like movies like that, and uh, you know, it's a it's a it's a mob slash mafia movie. 
uh, or movie <laughs> game. Um, Pauly is one of the characters in there, and he is uh, not always in a good way. He does some very unpleasant things as well. Um, but uh, it, he's always kind of got a little uh, tongue-in-cheek response, um, you know, and there's tragedy involved with that character as well. So if you're a fan of movies like that, you know, going back to The Godfather as well, you know, there's always that character that uh, you know, is doing some very serious and disturbing things, but always kind of figures out a way to throw uh, some dark humor and joke into it. Um, that is Pauly, uh, played by, I think, the voice actor Jeremy Luke. So, um, you know... All, don't, don't necessarily find Polly a likable character, um, but he's definitely the comic relief uh, to that story, um, which, you know, is really composed of a lot of very serious tones, and so he's the, the one element of humor uh, throughout that thread. Okay, Swiss. You chose Paper Mario for your storycraft. Do the toads end up as your comic relief, or do you take a different path here? Well, I did say that there was a very strong uh, competitive battle for my best storycraft pick. So, no, the Toads will not be uh, getting um, a three-peat, I don't know, hat trick, I guess, would we say, in the comic relief. I picked Kenji from Ghost of Tsushima. And Kenji is kind of the, uh, like, a, a side character that um, he's very... Uh, He's always got something to say. He's very quick-witted, but he's kind of like your buddy that always gets you in trouble. Um, and he reminds me, he's kind of like a not-so-honest merchant, but kind of wants to be, I don't know. He he reminds me a lot about a, a little bit more of a charming quirk from Deep Space Nine, to be honest with you. Um, so that kind of somewhat lovable, but um, only because of his like character flaws almost um so i enjoyed it and uh they they're in a few of his little tales where it focuses on him they they did have some very um humorous dialogue when especially when he kind of gets his comeuppance with some of the villagers and uh you know they they basically let him know how they feel about his character so it's good nice excellent so we've had some good stories and some good laughs and because e2kg is we are all parents and one of the things we enjoy doing is gaming with our families as well and all, all throughout the year you've heard us talk about you've heard prime talk about playing halo master chief with his family in a three-way death match <laughs> great bonding time you've also heard us talk uh you know play minecraft dungeons and a number of other games uh with family members so prime as someone who has talked a number of times on the show this year about playing games with your family what made your family game night of the year uh, so this year it is Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2, so the remastered uh, edition of these two games. Uh, yeah, I mean, we played, you know, Halo and uh, um, Minecraft Dungeons and stuff like that too. But this one, this one I think kind of kind of brought us all together basically because one, for my, my son, he's, you know, he's big into skating now or, uh, you know, skateboarding now. He's played uh, Skate 3 and some of these other games. But uh, I think Tony Hawk is a little bit, it's, it's a little bit more user friendly, or at least like, you know, uh, uh, if you're trying to get into these type of games friendly, uh, you know, the combos, even though it does run a lot faster than Skate 3, but the combos are a lot simpler. You know, you don't have to worry about the stick control and stuff like that, like in Skate 3. Uh, and then it brings me and my wife back into this game because we played this back in the day when it originally came out. Uh, so, you know, even though you can only do two people at once, in this game, you know, we just, you know, you know, pass controls around. We'll, we'll all take our turns and, you know, do, doing different levels and uh, trying to do tricks and stuff like that. So, yeah, Pro, Tony Hawk Pro Skater 1 and 2 is my choice. Excellent. So, Gasicles, did you have a family game night? And if so, what is your choice for family game night? Because this one, I, I'm really curious on, on how you came about this choice for your family game night. Yeah, so I, I continue to be waiting in the wings. I'm actually still, uh, you know, basically I pick games that I theoretically would uh, be suitable for a family game night because my kids aren't at the age where they play games yet. Um, I've been slow in introducing them to that, and they are uh, 
they're at that age where I'm struggling through the, uh, you know, we, we, we don't argue and we don't fight while playing games. You know, that, that results in, it, you know, everything gets shut down um, because, you know, we're not going to go down the path of, you know, gamers who, uh, who can't deal with adversity and can't deal with frustration and can't deal with sportsmanship. So, uh, right, so right now they, just, they play the retro box, which actually fairly recently they've actually become very enamored with after trying to get them onto that thing. Uh, so maybe my original plan of kind of making them go through the history of 8-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit until they're caught up may actually uh, come to fruition without necessarily going through every single console like I'd originally planned. Um, but basically, so so what I do is I I play games, uh, and I don't have the Switch upstairs. So I think last year or maybe the year before, I picked you know, Skylanders Imaginators because uh, my oldest daughter does actually come down uh, to my office and, and play that game, um, and I let her play it, the, the younger one. I... I I don't think uh, has that mechanical coordination yet, um, but there wasn't really like anything like that uh, because uh, because the switch well has kind of dried up. But that's another topic. Um, so, uh, but um, but the game that I played that I think that they would like is was Orion: The Will of the Wisps. Um, and and actually, I mean, this could have also been my pick for uh, for most surprising game or surprise game. Like I was amazed that I actually acclimated to this game and 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 attached myself to it um and found the experience really enjoyable for about 18 hours I, I haven't completed the game but i'm probably about four to five hours from completion so i've got it kind of near the top of the backlog ready to re-engage uh, at a moment's notice but uh you know but it's uh it's a wonderful tale um it's age appropriate it doesn't you know bring up too many topics you know, it doesn't bring up any topics that i would you know not be willing to talk about uh, with my kids at their age um, and it's graphically and visually uh, appealing and beautiful in a way that I think would uh, would uh, would keep would hold their interest. Yeah, for they're at that cartoon age where so the more realistic things look, um, and and the more live action they look, the less interested they are. Uh, but I, so I feel like Ori and the Will of the Wisp would be uh, kind of squarely in their wheelhouse. Excellent. I agree. It's a beautiful game, um, animated just amazingly. Swiss. We are, have been blessed to have your family on this podcast at different times, sometimes wandering through the background, um, and sometimes Vela joins us as well. So what is your choice of family game night this year? Um, there's a few different choices. Uh, you know, Minecraft Dungeons, my son and I just uh, beat the boss like a week ago, really. Um, we played through that together. Uh, you know, I obviously played a lot of Destiny 2 with my wife, but... Um, I kind of tried to find one where there was a bigger crowd that could play together than just kind of a tooth person. And um, we don't have like a Mario Party or a Smash that came out this year. But the one game that we did all play together was um, Clubhouse Games 51 Worldwide Classics for the Switch. And uh, my brother-in-law brought his Nintendo Switch over one evening. And we did the whole Nintendo gimmick thing where you can put the Switches together and have all the little mini games. And, you know, for what it was, which was just a family getting together. And um, I, I, I'm not sure if it was for a birthday party at some point or what the, the reasoning was, but we we're this was just kind of what we were doing while we were hanging out together. So this was quite um, literally the family game night game for uh, for my household. So the pick excellent excellent choice um uh, for uh, you know in one of the few games that nintendo released this year um, so thanks for highlighting uh, that so my choice was was going to be something but it only released just recently on pc it never actually released on xbox this year and that's where i played the demo with my sons for probably you know we played the most, and it had the most yelling and laughing. Uh, this game was Unspottable, which is just a little party game where you're all moving around and you're trying to figure out who is the, the you know, you're trying to, you're all like-minded, you're all similar imaged characters on the board, and you are trying to to punch the, the other characters out. Um, so it is a simple little game, but it was hours of endless fun for us. 
And then my my honorable mention here, because this game technically isn't out on the platform that we engaged on it in, is also Dreams. Is the Sony uh, Media Molecule. There we go. I got it. Uh, because we did the same thing. The first half of the year was very much a Dreams sit around the couch and see what kind of crazy, broken uh, user created levels we can find and the second half of the year was sitting around the couch and uh, trying to to punch each other virtually so very fun uh, both games and spotable is something that uh, hopefully will be coming out on a variety of consoles in the coming year so let's move on to our next category and in this year of 2020 where we had some Big name breakthroughs in terms of high profile games, uh, both in terms of, of streaming and in terms of critical uh, games that engaged uh, mm, the general culture is really what our category is next is it, games that have been they're most likely to be mentioned in other media as pop culture. And in the year of 2020, in a year when game spending more than doubled over the previous year. We saw huge increases in game spending as large chunks of America and the and the world had time of, of shelter at home or quarantine. There was a lot of spending on games. And so that also brought a lot of attention to games this year. So Swiss, what is your game most likely to be mentioned in pop culture? I cheated a little bit on this one. Um, technically, my game wasn't released in 2020, but in my defense, but nobody knew about it. Is the most, yes, the most no, pop culture game at this point. Right. Nobody, nobody really until 2020 when it when it um, really hit the map, which is Among Us um, by Inner Sloth. And uh, you know, like you said, uh, DV, this is the one that's like out there for even. I mean, even my uh, one of my sisters in law that is not a gamer like sat down and played some among us with us at one point and uh you know it, it introduced new vocabulary slang into the lexicon like all of a sudden my 10 year old's walking around saying man that's really sus dad and uh because he saw somebody say sus and you know on a youtube video about among us so um yeah for i mean i i think I struggled to see any game that was released in 2020 that had any sort of the impact like Among Us did. So I, I thought it was okay that I, I kind of bent the rules a little bit. Yeah, I think so. I mean, tell me the last time that a sitting elected U.S. congressperson streamed a video game uh, and, and it, you know. So, yes, I would say that this. The, and got the attention, uh, the amount of hundreds of thousands of views. Yes, there are probably Congress uh, elected officials that are streaming, um, but I would say uh, Among Us uh, has catapulted uh, the awareness of this game in a variety of fashions, in a variety of media outlets as well. So I guess, it please... Did, yeah, it did ahead. just release on Switch, so... That is true. Okay, Thank you, you, Indie Showcase uh, Osiris Prime. So yes, yeah. yesterday, technically, it did come out for a platform. So, Agastocles, your next game definitely has gotten mentioned in pop culture. Um, but tell us why you put it here. Yeah, and I'm probably, this is probably my one pick that I'm the most disappointed myself in that I didn't, maybe didn't really nail it, uh, even uh, e even in terms of, like, my own, like, making a selection for myself. Um, I, I went with The Last of Us Part Two just because I felt like um, there was so much of a groundswell behind uh, that game and so much of a vocalization of... Um, you know, approval or disapproval and um, and the divisiveness, you know, the polarizing effect of that game amongst the gaming community that maybe it would have crept out into, you know, into parents' windshield. Um, and of course, you know, with 140 million or so PlayStation 4s deployed throughout the world, you know, I, I felt like it may have uh, gotten into conversation around the dinner table. Um, again, to go back over the history of this category, you know, I think we injected it the year that Fortnite came out because that was the first time that really... You know, we thought about, like, the impact of a game that um, got into the uh, awareness of, you know, parents and non-gamers and, and things like that. Um, 
so I, I, you know, Among Us is probably definitely a, a much better pick, you know, which I didn't really uh, think of uh, entirely. Um, but I also felt like there wasn't anything like a Fortnite that like, the, I mean, I, I think mostly this category is about like, what what is a game that like the normals know about? And, uh, you know, the closest thing I could get to was The, the Last of Us Part Two. All right. So I will take that segue in terms of what the normals know about. And say, I'm pretty sure Prime's pick hits its spot on the nose. So tell us what your pick is, Prime. Yeah, so this this was talking about political parties. This was used for uh, the uh, uh, presidential uh, candidates, whether they actually endorsed it or not. It's been used in, in various um, products, you know, um, showing their wares. Uh, but that's Animal Crossing. Uh, so I think uh, New Horizons, excuse me, to be more specific. Uh, I think it, that was, n- and not only just because, uh, you know, obviously uh, it sold, you know, millions and millions, but like I said, this was kind of the the game that, you know, everybody was playing, you know, when COVID first hit. Uh, there was a, there was even in the, um, like a late night talk show that was built around it by, um, God, I was just trying Gary to Witta. Gary yep. Witta. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. So, you know, he made a whole, you know, YouTube, you know, talk show, you know, through this, uh, through this game and, you know, uh, just everybody has been, you know, using it for uh, all, all kinds of things, you know, whether, like I said, whether it's a presidential thing or, uh, you know, someone trying to, you know, uh, advertise their, their product or, or, you know, things like that. So, uh, you know, this was definitely, I think, on the minds of everybody out there, just beyond the, the gaming uh, the sphere. So, yep, Animal Crossing. And I will second that pick with Animal Crossing. This is very much the, the COVID 2020 game uh, of of spring quarantine is animal crossing it it drove sales of of switch uh, animal crossing itself as we know is now the second best-selling switch game and it's uh, hasn't even been released for a year yet um and i think you know when you have a hollywood writer like gary Witta, who also has chops in in video games but able to bring in kind of a-list celebrities into Animal Crossing, uh, it certainly is is something that has crossed over in terms of of its cultural awareness. So that's where Animal Crossing came in for me as well. So let's move from pop culture to what we think is most likely to be game of the year in other media outlets. So this is oftentimes this is our our kind of game of the year catch-all category of games that may not be our game of the year but a way to either uh, highlight or to take issue with a game that is going to show up in other game of the year lists so i guess please your turn to start us off and i'm guessing you're getting back on a soapbox about this one yeah yeah to echo db's description you know a a lot of times this is our uh, admission of guilt category it's you know a a game that we didn't like but we do have to admit that you know probably other people will pick it as their game of the year um uh you know for me it's again the last of us part two uh you know i will also say you know depending on when uh the individual cast members make their selections for this category it's often either uh like in my case i picked it before the vgas went down so um you know there was no way to know that that would be selected but it was part of that vga kind of guesswork of you know well what games most likely you know to be voted on by journalists um and in cases where you pick it uh, after the vgas it's the question of you know is the v are the vgas going to have that golden globe of effect right of like you know does does the movie pick then also win the oscar um and and last year i think we were very surprised because um, you know, Sekiro, Sekiro, um, no, I'm, I'm, no, I'm not pronouncing that uh, in the correct Japanese, uh, Swiss, um, but, you know, Sekiro won the VGA Game of the Year, but then uh, Goat Simulator, you know, was selected as Game of the Year by lots of other awards, um, but uh, but my my pick for this was... Goose the lo- Game, you mean, right? What's that? Not Goat Simulator. Goose Game? Goose Game, yes, yeah, sorry, yes, yeah, I'm mixing up the two... Uh, well, I, I won't describe them with the terms that I would describe them, but uh, I'm, I'm mixing the two because they're kind of in that same ballpark of, of type of game. Um, but yeah, but this year I picked The Last of Us Part Two. Uh, I think it, uh, you know, it's it's in the zeitgeist again. It 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 has a it has a positive narrative. You know, it, it has a story that needs to be told. I didn't care for the way in which it was told or the which the way it was presented um, or the gameplay surrounding it um, as much as some other games. Again, I, I don't think The Last of Us Part Two is a bad game, 
it it just doesn't rank up there as like the pinnacle of gaming development for me this year i personally feel like ghost of tsushima is a better game for me as a gamer um but i i do recognize that the last of us part two uh is is most likely to you know be selected out there i think there were a lot of votes for death stranding um among uh, among us last year for this category uh as well so it was interesting to see again it's always interesting to see what, what we think the industry is going to do and just see the way that it that it actually plays out across award season okay so this is our hat trick right here gentlemen this is the only time that we end up with a game that is awarded thrice in the same category so and it's not last of us part two prime what did you choose as most likely to be game of the year in media outlets yes yeah, so i i did think of uh last of us part two but being being at home uh working from home because of covid these past um six to nine months however long i don't even know it's, it's seems like five years to me but I've been able to catch back up on a lot of my podcasts, video game podcasts and listening to these different podcasts. And most of them are from uh, IGN, but there, I have a couple other ones that, that I listen to too, but uh, almost in all the podcasts, I hear people praising this game and that's Hades, uh, which actually just, I believe it just recently came out with the last month or so, or a couple of few months, uh, at least for the consoles. It might've been out maybe so it's earlier. A, it's been on an Epic store, an early release. And then this year, uh, this fall, it came out for Switch and kind of a 1.0 release on the Epic Store. Yeah, so I mean, I have hear people praising it like all the time. It, it seemed interesting to me. I know it's like, um, what do you call it, a uh, roguelike uh, type of game where you know you just gotta kind of keep dying and starting over, you know, and getting better each time. Uh, but um, yeah, it was. I just that just kind of basically because I was keeping up with my my podcast and kind of. Um, uh, that just kind of came up like almost every time. So yeah, that's my pick, Hades. All right, Prime. Thank you, Swiss. Keep us rolling down this this uh, grease train. I'm actually surprised that both uh, you and Prime picked it as well because I thought this was going to be kind of my cynical. Uh, well, my reasoning is cynical, so that's why I kind of thought I'd be out on a limb with this one, but. Uh, I, I have my personal preferences, and um, you know, I don't know from a zeitgeist perspective. I don't know which game really would have separated itself. Um, some some years, it's like obvious, like that's going to be the game. Uh, this year, I didn't feel like there'd be a clear one that separated from the pack. So, when in doubt, I go with the hipster vote, and I choose the most indie title available. So when the VGAs kind of listed their slate, I'm like that's the one. That's the indie title that all the journos are going to want to use. Uh, Super Giant has a, a very well deserved reputation, but they're a media darling, and they're they're not going to be any title that they release is going to be overlooked. So that's how I settled on Hades. When um, I think DB, you did say you played it a week or two ago, and you had good things to say about it. So that was kind of enough for me to um, to go in that direction. But. So I'll keep it going. And yes, mine is Hades as well. But unlike you, I'll say Hades deserves it. It is, it's Supergiant's best game. And Supergiant has done Bastion. They've done Transistor. They've done Pyre. Uh, there's a reason that Supergiant is a media darling in terms of game journalism. Right? One of their their head writers is Greg Kasavin of, you know, t you know early, late 90s, early 2000s uh, GameSpot era. Um, but it is, one, it's artistically a beautiful game. Stylistically, it's a beautiful game. Uh, nor story-wise, it at one point was in my running to be StoryCraft because of the story that it tells and the characters that it develops within Greek myth. Uh, and I, I'm okay with a roguelike. Like, I enjoy Dead Cells. Um, there's some roguelikes that I, I enjoy. There's some that I find punishing and not nearly as fun as they could be. But the idea of kind of merging a roguelike with, you know, kind of the Diablo perspective in terms of a game and having really smooth flowing combat, which goes back into to Bastion and Transistor a little bit, uh, really was just a, a sweet spot for me in terms of, of this is a 
a really solid game. I have not played enough of it. Well, I've played enough to really enjoy it, but I will say that the it may not necessarily show up later in in this show as well. But it to me it deserves uh, the the praise that it's getting. So I was glad to see it getting nominated, and I'll be I'll be very understanding when it makes some some top ten, top fives, and and top games of the year. I think it's already Polygon's number one game of the year. So so let's go from from big media darlings to some hidden gems. So our next category is always one of my favorite because it's a chance that we kind of get a to to go to the B side, right? Like we we just got done with the the hit single, and now we get to flip over that that forty five record. And, and go to the B-side of a hidden gem or most overlooked game. So, Cyrus Prime, what is your most overlooked game hidden gem this year? Yeah, so for this one, this one was actually, uh, this one was a running for the surprise game, too, of, of this year. Uh, and this is Descenders, which is a um, downhill mountain biking game. Kind of in the vein of... Um, there's not really like a story or anything like there's like a campaign mode, but I mean, it's just like basically to unlock stuff and the, and the real kind of like bread and butter to this game is just kind of doing the kind of the free roam parks that you can do um, in this game and just kind of like, I guess it's kind of like a roguelike, but you don't, you don't get power ups or anything though. Cause you just, you know, it's just keep going down these Hills and, you know, do these crazy tricks and uh, try to do these like, like there's like little wooden ramps that you have to like slow down. Like a lot of the times you're just like you know, speeding down, going super fast. But other times you have to kind of like kind of finesse it, and you're going all along these like really skinny ramps and, and um, uh, roadway. Well, not really roadways, but like pathways. Uh, so yeah, this this one was a, a surprise to me. <laughs> and um, but yeah, it, it's it's a very fun game, uh, and you might see it. Maybe later on, also. <laughs> so, oh, give you a little preview interesting. there. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I will go next with my uh, hidden gem overlook game. And at first, I thought maybe it, you were right. Like, it, there's the potential for this to to have some some overlap with the surprise game. But my hidden gem and overlook game is a game. Again, I sat on the couch with my son and played through the entire game together. Uh, and this is Bug Fables. This is. Uh, on Switch. It's on all three consoles at this point. It released this year on console. It came out late in December on PC. And it is the spiritual successor. As much love as we've given to Paper Mario Origami King, this game is the Paper Mario game of 2020. So if you enjoy Paper Mario and you have not tried Bug Fables, it's 20, 25 bucks. It's going to be on sale during the holidays. It is in that same uh, kind of two-dimensional Paper Mario Thousand Year Door type of spin. Uh, it has a, a actually a really engaging story, some good humor, and a deep battle system that, unlike Paper Mario, where the battle system is at times irritating, at times, uh, you know, f it, something that you can forget about uh, or something you wish was over, this battle system has, you know, your your jockeying position because position in the line makes a difference. You've got standard attacks. You've got special, you know, magic abilities or special moves. They include the button presses that come with your Paper Mario aspects and timing. And so Bug Fables really just hits on all those notes. And it's a small indie team that made a love letter to the original kind of you know, Paper Mario, Paper Mario, Thousand Year Door uh, legacy, and and just nails it. It's a wonderful game. So, Swiss, what is your most overlooked game of the year? My most overlooked game this year is Ori and the Will of the Wisps. And I picked this game um, because, you know, all both the Ori games are, like, you know, well-crafted, beautiful games. Um, this one was, you know, especially so. Uh, I remember being excited about this when it was initially kind of announced and you saw the pre... I don't remember what E3 it was at or whatever, but um, I put it on my on my radar as a, as a potential pickup. Um, and for whatever reason, like, as I was kind of going back through this past year, I didn't feel like there was a lot of... Um, 
discussion about it or hype or it didn't have its moment in the sun when it was released and it happened to be released on march 11th which was just like i think march 12th was the that was right around the time that the nba player got covid and then like the next day was when everything really started to lock down so um it hit right when covid was um hit hammering uh hammering everybody in the united states and uh it, it probably got overshadowed by that and then a week or two later is when animal crossing's new horizons came out so uh, that's kind of a one-two punch i think that um kind of uh got got it off people's radar but from from everything what i've heard you know and, and read it, it was a fantastic game so that's why it's my hidden gem this year Excellent. And I guess because you put some time into Ori and the Will of the Wisp, and it showed up earlier on your list, but you were also known for your, your gaming rotation, and you get some pretty deep cuts. So what are you choosing tonight for most overlooked game of the year, Hidden Gem? Yeah, so this is an interesting year. Uh, first of all, on Swiss's pick, yeah, I, having played a lot of Ori, um, I didn't catch or just wasn't conscious of... Uh, the notion that that in its uh, in its release date it was squeezed kind of in similar ways to uh, was it 2018 that Titanfall 2 came out like in in between like smack dab Battlefield one and Call of Duty yeah yep. yeah it just got squeezed and like th then people discovered it like a year to two years later and were amazed at how wonderful a game it was um, so maybe the same thing will happen to Ori um, so so great analysis Swiss uh, I, I didn't didn't consciously think of that. Um, so my hidden gem most overlooked game is, and again, I'm a, I'm a big racing sim fan. I'm very familiar with a lot of the, you know, long running franchises. I've been a player of the dirt series since it was, you know, Colin McRae's dirt, um, back, uh, you know, 20 years ago or so. And I've been conscious and aware of the WRC series, which is kind of the, the next closest competitor WRC has always been, uh, you know, several steps behind Dirt in terms of uh, graphical fidelity and physics engine, and has been a, a less expensive game, and has been, uh, you know, something that some players maybe have reached for who didn't like Codemasters. I, I don't know, but it's always been kind of the, the uh, what I want to call it, the, I don't know, it's been like the knockoff brand uh, racing game of Rally. Um, and amazingly this year, I guess an, another developer uh, acquired the IP or maybe they acquired the, the other development studio or whatever, but a um, new developer, I think last year and this year, um, you know, where Dirt 5 is a you know, neat kind of tech demo for um, the Xbox Series XS and, uh, and the PlayStation 5, um, Dirt 5 this year is really just not uh, the, uh, you know, representative of forte that uh that that dirt installments have been the last few years um and this is one of the more arcadey versions you know the dirt series is in this TikTok of uh of an arcadey version and then a, a hardcore sim kind of version uh and this is the year that it, in my opinion like wrc the wrc franchise kind of snuck up behind them and uh and you know and pants them right right from behind uh it's uh, a pretty amazing game it is uh, staunchly true to the World Rally Championship in terms of its format and events and stages. Um, it almost maps almost perfectly against what that series actually is, which is something that uh, Dirt sometimes doesn't always do because they're trying to get fans into that ecosystem who, you know, need, you know, that, that you know, something that's a little more akin to traditional racing than just pure rally. Um but uh, it's also a great like progression system and team management system, and does some very interesting and neat things. Uh, it's a great physics engine. So um, you know, whereas Dirt gets a lot of accolades and is very popular and has kind of become infamous this year in terms of uh, Digital Foundry and all the things that that they've tested and pointed out um, are different between the Dirt instantiations on the Xbox Series X S and the PlayStation Five. Uh, WRC to me is this year's you know most um, you know the the best World Rally. Uh, racing game, um, taking that title away from from years and years of uh, of the Dirt franchise. All right, thank you. It's always good to this is this is why this this whole night is always enjoyable because it gives us a chance to look back on things, and and for not only 
collectors, viewers, but for ourselves to, to discover a few things along the way. So, so thanks for that analysis. All right. So my, uh, the next category, and I'll stay on the mic for this one, is the, this one is always a, a fun category as well because it is the game that is most likely that we regret trading, which we created this back when trading in a game was a thing, right? Yeah. Like, I thought of that, like, oh, wait a minute, this is... But it's more or less basically a game that we either gave up on or a game that we didn't get a chance to really dive into or not play in 2020. So my pick here is is tied right in with our last GX show gaming assignment. And so that gaming assignment, for those of you that, that were here, it, it was to go back on something that you missed this year and give it a give it a chance or come back to something that you need to give a second chance to. And it was very much within this category that I thought of that. And Half-Life Alex was very much the game that, you know, it's a game I wish I had more time to play. It is a game that come Christmas break, come semester break uh, for my job, and uh, you know holidays that hopefully i'll have some time to to lose myself in the daylight in in the oculus rift and not have uh, you know not have to worry so much about um about my daytime responsibilities and can can live in this world and get a chance to play through half-life alex uh in vr so that is my my uh, regret for not spending more time during the summer when when i had Kobe quarantine time to to dive into. So, Agasocles, what is your game that you uh, what's your game pick for this category? Something that you regret uh, not getting a chance to either invest in or not get a chance to play? Yeah, this is my pick that is really representative of uh, all hail Game Pass and the amazing thing that it is um, in in surfacing games to uh, a, a a point above the horizon where they can be discovered by gamers because. Steam for what it all is um, that is good, uh, I would say is an absolute trash pile when it comes to discoverability. Um, it, it, it does nothing. Like, I, I cannot go into Steam and find something. Um, I, I always have to Google outside of Steam, find the thing that I need, and then go to Steam, um, you know, and, and search for that thing by its exact name. Uh, I, you know, there are some, there are some, you know, scant use cases where I can do differently, but I'd say 92% of the time. Um, but Game Pass, you know, brings a lot of titles to the thing, and then, and then, you know, with their media campaign, brings them into that, you know, you know, recently added uh, screen, which is where I pick everything up. I will admit, you know, once something's in Game Pass, I'm not going to find it, you know, weeks later. Um, but, uh, but I do pay attention to that, you know, uh, you know, arriving now or arriving recently category, and uh, I've never played a Crusader Kings game. That franchise has been around for who knows how long. It's kind of been in that vein of, uh, I'm not even sure right off the top of my head who the publisher is, but it's always been in the vein of some of those franchises like uh, Port Royale or um, some of the other kind of city builder strategy games that are, you know, shaved close to the civilization kind of model, but are something different or genre or, um, you know, period of man specific or period of history specific. So, excuse me, <laughs> you know, a frog stuck in my throat. Um, so this year, you know, Crusader Kings 3 came to the Game Pass uh, platform service. Uh, I dove into it. Uh, it's it's amazing um, in the level of detail that it provides. I've mentioned before how, you know, one of the aspects I love of the Total Rome series is I love uh, family management, you know, is like the meta that I most like. You know, Grand Strategy is great. The RTS piece of it is great. Um, but I love just, like, managing my family tree and marrying people off and, you know, you know, eventually, you know, identifying the person who's eventually going to rise and become the heir, um, who is not, you know, it's not always, you know, the oldest male child. You know, sometimes things happen differently. Crusader Kings gives you a lot of different options for that as well. Um, I would say even in the Total War series has, just in terms of it, it offers the complexity of the world. And so there are options to have, like, a female heir become the leader of your civilization um or I, I think in one of the scenarios i played you like to to marry a, a female off who wouldn't have become your heir um but is able to become like the leader of another nation because she actually by class like outranks the person you're marrying her to so 
she takes over like their territory if they die off. So it's an incredibly complex game from that family management perspective. It's great. It's wonderful. Uh, but I need to spend more time uh, with that kind of game. Unfortunately, it's it's kind of one of those games like you, if you're going to play it, you got to sit down for two to four hours to really get into the meat of it. And so uh, that's the one that I, I most regret that my uh, variety gamer lifestyle uh, did not give me time to, to kind of pull apart as much as I'd like. Nice pick, nice pick, and nice uh, recognition there of Game Pass. You're exactly right. Like I've been discovering more things each week. Prime, what is your pick for something that you regret uh, not getting a chance to dive into this this year? So my pick is because I don't have the console, so I couldn't play this game. I don't have a PS4 or a PS5, and that is Ghosts of Tsushima. Uh, I- like kind of the, the Greek mythology and, and culture, I kind of like this, you know, I like the Japanese uh, warrior samurai type of games also. Uh, but unfortunately, like I said, I don't have, I don't have Sony PlayStation. So I couldn't play this game. It, it did, did get me thinking uh, of, and along with uh, Spider-Man of, of getting a, a PlayStation, but I unfortunately have not gotten one yet. So hopefully one day I can uh, go back and, and play ghosts of Tsushima and, um, it seems to be, you know, a uh, fairly uh, well-rounded game, and I've heard nothing good about it, so I don't think I'd be disappointed from it. Right. So let's go from somebody who's longing to play Ghost of Tsushima to somebody who's invested a significant time in it. But Swiss is, I'm guessing Ghost isn't your choice for this category. So what is your choice for this category? Uh, I picked Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity just because um, I haven't played it yet. It's a AAA Zelda title, and I don't care that it's a Warriors game because it's a Zelda title. So, um, yeah, it, it, the um, I love Breath of the Wild, so I'm kind of intrigued about like them kind of doing a prequel. Um, but you know, it's ultimately this is a simple calculation for me. I'm just chuckling at the fact that you gave a Muso game a triple A status. So uh, congratulations for that. So let's move on. This is we are rounding the end here. The 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 finish line is in sight, gentlemen. Our last two categories. And this one is usually kind of our our big our, our big shot. This is this is sometimes our game of the year. It's not necessarily game of the year because it is our life of the party, most fun game. This is the game that maybe it is the life of the party. Maybe this was a great time experience. Maybe this was simply just the game you had the most fun with in a year. Um, and in a year like this year, this is a much needed category. So it is good that we can celebrate games that we have enjoyed ourselves with, games that we have had a lot of fun with. So Prime... You hinted that a game might be coming back on your list. What game did you have the most fun with this year? Yeah, so this one is Descenders. Once again, the uh, downhill mountain biking racing game, or not really racing, and just kind of uh, you going down the hill and doing these crazy stunts and, and, and tricks. And I had a lot of fun with uh, uh, with my son with this one. Uh, this was another one that would have been almost like a family game, but it was really just me and my son, and I was I was looking for something with the whole family for that category. So, uh, but this one, it, you know, you're rolling down the hill and, and and you know hit it hit a good jump, and you're like, oh yeah, we made it, or you know you you like ragged you ragged all down the side of the mountain because you you know you tripped up and you 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 turned when you should have you know flipped or something like that. So this is uh, definitely we ha- I had the most fun, and. Um, weird thing in this game was when you hit the end of the uh the edge of the, the world or the map that you're playing on you just get like rubber band shot back and you know into the into the world so it's it's just a weird thing that we you know we like to play and, and kind of just fool around with so yep the senders <clears throat> excuse me is the senders once again all right so swiss you have another returning uh winner here for this category what is your what's the game you had the most fun with this year well i kind of there was a point in our discussion about the categories where Agasicles did mention, not that he's the like the final arbiter of the decision, but he, he did say he would understand if um, we chose two games. And uh, I did kind of, because I looked at Life of the Party and most fun game um, in two different lights, kind of. 
I went ahead and took that uh, opportunity, and I chose two games. Uh, so for Life of the Party, I chose Paper Mario the Origami King just because it's such a joy, like story-wise and funny and uh, just upbeat to play. And um, But for the most fun game this year, which would probably most align with my game of the year, I picked Ghost of Tsushima. So that's definitely the game that I've uh, enjoyed spending the most time in um, during 2020. It's um just, and it's it's a game that fits all in my wheelhouse for a number of reasons. Um, just the the open world action adventure game plus uh you know Japan feudal Japan and um I've just had a lot of uh I, I enjoy the story I enjoy the storytelling in it although I know I gave it to Paper Mario gave the edge to Paper Mario but there's just a number of um uh aspects to to ghost of tsushima where um it was pretty much it was a very easy pick for me for for most fun game well deserved so let's keep the the parsing of of categories here and i guess please i think you've parsed this as well and you've got two two winners here so what are your two well, so I, the first thing I want to do is uh, drop an alibi for that last round the most likely to regret trading or not playing in 2020 um you know, each year, this is a, it's a dynamic we go through every single year, and that is that there are games that hit in the holiday season that we, as much as we try, we just don't get around to collectively. Um, and frequently those rear themselves, rear their heads in, you know, the early gamer experience shows for next year. So, you know, a few games that I should mention that, you know, were out there that I know I didn't get around to were Watchdog Legion, which I have, but haven't had a chance to dive into. Uh, haven't had a chance to dive into uh, Age of, uh, or Assassin's Creed Age of, uh, or Valhalla uh, at this point. Um, and haven't had a chance to pull apart uh, Spider-Man Miles Morales. So there are some pretty, you know, you know, highlighty games in there that uh that you know we i didn't get around to i I don't know if anybody else got around to them and we'll see if any uh things like cyberpunk or anything rear their heads here uh in the last couple categories uh the other thing that i will mention db is uh this is my choice where i will choose to make a change uh to what i submitted for my selection just uh based on how the dynamics and things have gone the last few weeks um you know, I, I, what I had down was a Call of Duty uh, Modern Warfare, like, you know, the remake from last year, the remake reboot from last year, and also uh, siding then with Swiss and making two selections and uh, designating most fun, most fun as Ghost of Tsushima. But this is kind of a repeat of uh, 2014, 15, 16, somewhere around there, where I have to give a nod to a game that I'm just dumping a lot of time into even though I may not feel great about the pick in terms of how the game itself compares to other um, uh, players on the field. But uh, in the last week, I've just had a surge of time that I've been dumping into Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, uh, which I'm going to go ahead and pick and make it my pick for most fun game and life of the party um, because, uh, because, of it, because, of, because of its breaking out from its past history where I've fallen off of the Call of Duty series. I have never liked the Black Ops franchise. Um, I am not a huge Call of Duty multiplayer player. But I tell you, this year I finished the single player campaign. Um, maybe it's has, it probably has something to do with a lot of that. That is my childhood. Like the Cold War and those types of stories are the things that I grew up with. Um, and then I have continued to dump a ton of time into the multiplayer um, and have, have have crossed the isthmus from, you know, the core game into the release of the season one patch, and I've, you know, noted all of the patch notes and the things that have been added, and found lots of surprises, and have been, you know, one of the first people to get the patch and, you know, see, complain, or highlight things that other people need to watch out for. So, it's weird. It's a strange place to be in. Um, but but yeah, that my my pick for most fun game is going to be Call of Duty: uh, Black Ops Cold War. Excellent. It's nice to to have a, a you know a, a surging uh, pick here at the end of the at the end of the season. So yes, you are absolutely right. There are some games that that don't quite always get on our radar. There are some games that turn out a little too late. Uh, I think Cyberpunk definitely is in that category of things that came out late for our consideration. 
And I would, I, uh, if this was a day or two later, maybe cyberpunk would have gotten into our sleazy business practices, wretched scum villainy, depending on how everything plays out there as well. But, but that is not the case. So I just have to go back to the game I had the most fun with. That it is not the game necessarily I spent the most time with, but it is the game that put the biggest smile on my face. It is the game that I just enjoy playing and still do it shouldn't be a surprise because it, it's its counterpart was my most fun game of 2018 and as much as i really wanted to try to find the fun in marvel's avengers as soon as i picked up spider-man miles morales and started swinging i there was no turning back right like i've gone back and tried my uh, marvel's avengers and 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 every time I do, I think well, I should just be swinging this Spider-Man. Um, it's so much more fun, and and it's also a, it is a greatly packaged game. Like it takes the good combat, adds a few uh, new tricks in it with with some of the Venom strikes and things like that. It tightens up the story because it's a smaller game. It doesn't have the kind of open world bloat that it, it really keeps things tightly packed together so the narrative keeps flowing the characterizations of, of miles and his surrounding uh universe of characters is is well realized they're a group of characters that in comics has always been interesting enjoyable and and has brought things to the, the comic book uh discussions and i'm glad for that uh, but again it is it's fun to just flop on a different suit swing around and, and see what comes up next and so that's why spider-man miles morales is my most fun game of the year so now if you've been sitting on your hands with your e2kg bingo card waiting for us to talk about some of our 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 normal games our games that make it into frequent rotation this category you, you, you know go back and check your bingo card because you might be missing one and, and now's the chance that we might hit it so this final category we'll hit on some games that, that we've talked about tonight but we're also hit on some games that if you've been listening to us or you've got to have a chance if you're just finding this show right now go back and listen to a few episodes you know we're not always the most polished but we enjoy what we do we are glad to share it with you, and we hope that you'll stick with us into 2021. And that is our final category of the night is, what is the game that we are most likely to be playing in 2021? So, please, you just got done praising Call of Duty Black Ops. Does the game make a, a, a repeat performance here as the game that you are most likely to be playing in 2021? Uh, well, you, you think that it might, you know, and, and again, I, I, I tied that game back to uh, the same reasons that I picked Destiny, you know, after the Taken King came out for this category, because, you know, I had to acknowledge that it was the thing that I was dumping the most time into, and so you would think that that would be the thing that I would highlight as still being, still going to be playing in 2021, but I, I concurrently, I also have to admit, there's a good chance that I'll just fall off the Call of Duty bandwagon, right, at some point, that... You know, I'll, I'll get enough of it, or a season pass might come along, and I'll just say, ah, you know, it's, it's, I've, I've gotten my ROI out of it. Uh, and so what I'm going to leave as my choice is the fact, uh, is the franchise that I definitely want to get back to plumbing through the mythology and experiencing the games that I haven't experienced and getting through that single-player story-driven aspect. And so the game that I'm most likely to still be playing in 2021 is a... Is a technically a remake remake remaster effort from 2020 which is uh halo the master chief collection um i strongly suspect that even if i continue to play black ops i will definitely make my way back around to halo the mcc on pc and uh continue going through uh the games that i haven't played um and experiencing you know those final uh iterations that have been ported over to pc uh this year by 343 studios Excellent choice. Yes, so much game to play through. Uh, Prime, now's your chance. Hit us with your your E2KG bingo card. What is your 2020 game that you will be playing the most of? Uh, oh, man, I don't know. Most of? Uh, Fair enough. So most pretty... likely to be still playing <laughs> in 2021. 
Well, and this uh, one, we're all nod our heads when you say it. <laughs> yeah. You could probably uh, guess this one, but uh, I will say that pretty much every game on this list, other than Ghosts and uh, Hades, just because I don't have them, I'll be I'll be playing. But this is the one game I picked for this one is I didn't mention uh, yet this. Excuse me, this episode, uh, which actually I guess Cleese just did in the last category, which is Call of Duty Black Ops Cold War, and actually. Uh, Black Ops was actually one of one of the uh, as the series in in the Call of Duty franchise that I actually did kind of gravitate more to other uh, from uh, Modern Warfare or some of the other ones, the Ghosts and some of the other uh, kind of Splinter um, series that kind of came out of uh, Call of Duty. But yeah, the, Black Ops has always been uh, one of my favorite series uh, in the Call of Duty um, uh, pantheon of games. Uh, but and. The weird thing is that I've been playing a lot of uh, Battle Royale games, obviously, if, if you've been watching these past shows in this past year, past few years, actually. Um, but for this one, I actually went back just to the regular uh, competitive multiplayer, you know, deathmatch, team deathmatch, and, you know, um, those type of game, that type of multiplayer game. So I just, you know, it's just like riding a bike or slipping into, you know, comfortable shoes. I just, like, got right back into it. And, you know, it probably helps that I... I I do a lot better in the Black Ops uh, series than Modern Warfare. I, I mean, and not, not. The, I hate to, I hate to say this, but I do, I do have a good, a pretty positive KD uh, in these games. So, uh, not nothing super, you know. Uh, you know, I'm not like three, four, you know, point whatever. You know, I'm, I'm usually one or twos, but uh, I do get a positive, you know, KD in these games. So I, I don't know what it is. It's just, um, and that's it's just, I'm, I just clicked with it. And that's ED now. They've they've changed the term to elimination versus death. Oh, elimination is death. Okay. Yes, because I think they give you credit for uh, I don't know so, some some alternative method of of scoring. Oh, okay. Like an assist or something, or. Yeah, yeah I think you get assists in there and uh, and th- yeah. things that are you know takeouts from uh, field upgrades and uh, and score shot wow. score streaks. Score streaks. See, this okay, is yeah. why you read the patch notes. Thank you, Agassiz. <laughs> that's right see i was still going old terminology but yeah no definitely I, i'll be i'll still be playing this uh the season one just dropped this week which i, I don't know if I'll, I'll jump into the battle pass or not there's always free stuff in there too but uh and that does carry over into the uh competitive multiplayer too not just the the battle royal so that's kind of nice that you still get you still unlock stuff so yeah definitely uh cold war i'll be still playing excellent that is that is True to life, I would suspect. Uh, and my game that I am likely to still be playing in 2021 is when, I, when I've when i hit this category on the nose, it's usually a big old open world game. As somebody who sunk 20, 122 hours into Assassin's Creed Odyssey the year after it came out, there's a good likelihood that I'm going to sink a ton of time into, into this year's better Assassin's Creed game, Ghost of Tsushima. So, uh, for all the reason that we have talked about it tonight, uh, Ghost of Tsushima will be a game that I know that, it's a game that sucked me in in an epic scale when I first played it, uh, but because of release schedules and everything else and life, I never got a chance to really dive in to the same uh, immersive level that I wanted to, and so this is why... I'm looking forward for for everything that you guys talked about and praised about it tonight. One of the reasons I'm looking forward to diving back into it. But Wait, rounding out, say, I know, yeah, please do. Can, can I just say what a twist? <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe I, not. Really. I was certain that uh, I thought I thought we were going to hear Age of Valhalla. I was certain that's the road he was heading down. But interesting. No, I'm going to say that that Ghost of Tsushima is is the better. Is the better model of that uh, this year? So, have you um, played a lot of? No, I have not played a lot. Um, um. But I, I will say, and I'll, I'll say, hmm. Okay, maybe I'll say that it, it maybe isn't technically the better game. Maybe it is. Maybe it's not. Um, I will say that it feels like Assassin's Creed, but. Valhalla to me just feels so much like Assassin's Creed. Like it is after doing Origins, and doing Odyssey, and now Valhalla just feels like, oh, now I'm doing this in the snow. Like, yeah, I was, I was going to ask you if it was Assassin's Creed fatigue after all the time, because you spent a lot of time in in Origins and then followed that 
right up with Odyssey. So, yeah, I can, I can, I can see, I can definitely see uh, your justifications and rationale in that. So yes, that's not a knock necessarily on Valhalla. It is more of Ghost of Shima feels a little different, but still in that in that wheelhouse for me. So, but truthfully, as all the E two K G gamers, viewers, listeners know that. Another game that is always in my wheelhouse and will undoubtedly be something that I'll still be playing in 2021 is something that I hope I'm also going to be playing with Swiss Guard and his lovely spouse as well in 2021. So Swiss, what is your choice for the game that you'll still be playing in 2021? Well, I think the odds are good because I picked uh, Destiny 2 Beyond Light and um, there. For a couple of reasons. One is, uh, you know, I'll definitely be playing Ghost of Tsushima, but there's a pretty good chance I may actually complete that before December 31st. Um, but now that I'm going to have a little bit of vacation time, and uh, you know, that's pretty much my game of the year. I want to, I want to get back into it. But Destiny 2 Beyond Light, uh, one, it's a service game, so there's always, you know, whether or not the new stuff is worthwhile varies from month to month season to season but uh it's a service game there's new stuff it's a joy to play it has great gunplay they didn't completely ruin um gambit when they did the update <laughs> and uh you know so i i enjoy playing it um but really the the biggest reason is as db alluded to is uh i get to play it with people um both DB and Agascles, and you know, I wish uh, I wish they had a cross play so I could play with Prime as well. But um, on the PC, it's on the roadmap uh, for 2021, so uh, so maybe there will be a chance. So uh, you know, we always I always enjoy playing with you guys, and uh, you know, it's my wife Vela's. It's one of her favorite games. Um, so really, it's like a his and her title. So if I want to, you know, relax and hang out and play a game with my wife, it's gonna nine times out of ten it's gonna be destiny two. So um there's a really good chance that I will be playing it far into twenty twenty one. Well and the wonderful thing about E2KG and and you fine gentlemen is that so many of these games experiences, whether it's it Master Chief and Call of Duty and Destiny, that we will find time to play together. Sometimes there'll be enjoyable experiences like like our strikes and gambit messages in Destiny. Sometimes there'll be uh, disappointing, head-shaking uh, experiences like Crucible. So, or Bleeding Edge, right? And there are chances that our games that we will play in 2021 are going to surprise us. They're going to excite us. They're going to disappoint us. But the, the great thing about E2KG, the thing that I really value, is that we get a chance to do it together. We get a chance to experience these games together. We get a chance to come back together week after week, talk about our experiences, get into the Discord chat and and talk about our our daily game experiences, our our takes on the news, and and every week we get a chance to to bring it to our viewers, listeners, uh, and those of you out there. So those of you that have been with us uh, on and off throughout the year, those of you that have jumped into the streams, thank you. But those of you that are discovering us in in the year 2020 or in the year 2024 and trying to figure out why everybody was so down in the year 2020 that but we are so glad to to have everybody in the e2kg community and a chance to to engage and continue to and play uh, with all of you as well so that being said the next time that you will hear from us on the e2kg network will be in the year 2021 we are taking a two-week holiday hiatus here on E2KG. We've got some holidays coming up, uh, regardless of what you celebrate. But we are going to take some time, take some family, because we are uh, parents. We are uh, adults, grown-ups who game. We are oh, professionals, or at least we get paid to do daytime jobs in addition to this wonderful uh, hobby of ours that we love to invest so much time in. But we are taking some time 
uh, the next two weeks. So the next time we'll be back here is on Thursday, January 7th with another new episode. We'll be wrapping up the year of 2020 in gaming and we'll have our chance to start looking forward to 2021. So thank you for joining us tonight uh, on this, this gaming superlative show for the year of 2020. Thank you, Osiris Prime. Swiss Guard and Agassically Stamus for joining me and allowing me to be your your semi esteemed host tonight and and keeping us moving and like all good award shows ran over time, but that's okay. That's what an award show is for is to give us a chance to highlight and to to rally for and against some of our gaming experiences over this last year. So for myself, DBQ Hams and the collective E2KG Network, thank you for this year. So remember, not only in this year, but in all years, play the games you love. Love those you play with. And take care of yourself and those around you. Good night. <laughs>